I've always believed that you can either have a saver's mentality or an earner's mentality. For the savers, they feel like they have a fixed income and they can't do anything to break that. The income is what it is, and for them to actually grow wealth and to accumulate money, they have to save. They have to cut costs wherever they can. So having a high credit score and lower interest payments will help them save money. But you're making care. money and you're profitable. That's yeah. The, and that's the thing. Right. And so that, that's the other side of it of, uh, you know, hey, once I get access to, let's say, 100K in, in business funding, which is usually the number that gets thrown around out there, what do I do with it? And if you're asking, what do you do with it? Then you probably have to re-question how you're running your business and what your end goal is, rather than just, again, chasing the 800 or chasing the 100K in funding. In total, probably over $250,000 in business credit. And we're 20 years old. And so <laughs> what we take, we literally teach people all the time, like, you know, if you just, if you have good personal credit, you can automatically personal guarantee it if you want to. And then, it, or you could just go strictly like business credit and do that to, for your, you know, secure. Cause even a lot of the portals for paying your rent, you can pay with a credit card. Most people think that you can't invest in real estate until you have good credit, but this is actually false. And in fact, there are so many different ways that you can buy real estate regardless of what your credit score is. If you're new to my channel, my name is Ryan Pineda. I'm a real estate investor here in Las Vegas, and I've flipped hundreds of homes, I've bought hundreds of rentals, and I've invested in real estate in almost every way you can imagine. Now, when I was just getting started back in 2010, I was one of the people who thought that you needed great credit in order to buy a home. In my mind, you had to get a conventional loan, which required two years of tax returns and a credit score above 700. But unfortunately for me, I didn't realize until over 10 years later that I could have been buying all of those homes if I knew then what I know today. So let's go over a few different ways that you can start buying homes today, regardless of your credit score. One way to do it is through a hard money or soft money loan. So a hard money loan is typically what I use for flipping houses. The negatives are it's a higher interest loan that is more short term. So with conventional financing, you can get interest rates in the 3% range. You can also get 30 year loans. With hard money loans, your interest rate's gonna be anywhere from eight to 12% and it's usually only for a year. And you might be asking yourself, why would you get that kind of loan then? Well, the reason is you're flipping the house, so it's not that important to have a long-term loan or even a lower interest rate. You're gonna be in and out of it really quick. But the other reason they're useful is because they allow you to get into a lot of deals regardless of your credit. In fact, at this very moment, I have over $20 million out in hard money loans. And I can tell you, I would not qualify for $20 million of conventional loans right now. But the hard money lenders know I'm looking to flip the property so it's not a big deal to them that I have so much debt out. They're not running my credit scores every time they give me a new loan on a house flip. All they really care about is the deal itself. If I've got a good enough deal that's below market value, they're gonna fund it. And the other benefit is, instead of taking 30 to 45 days like a conventional loan does to close, hard money can close in a week if you need it. The only trade-off is you've got a shorter term and higher interest rates. Now, a soft money loan is kind of a cross between hard money and a conventional loan. Maybe the rate isn't eight to 12%, but it's six to seven. The term isn't as short as the one year that hard money has, but it's not as long as the 30 year that a conventional has. I've seen a lot of soft money loans that are around five to seven years. But the good thing with a lot of these soft money loans is is, once again, they don't care about your tax returns and they don't care about your credit. So depending on what you're looking to do, if it's flipping a house, then you're probably gonna get a hard money loan. And if it's keeping it as a rental, you're probably gonna get a soft money loan. And in fact, many of the rentals I own are with soft money loans. Now you might be wondering, why not just get a soft money loan on all of your flips? It's cheaper interest and it's a longer term. Well, a lot of these loans have prepayment penalties and they don't close as fast as hard money loans. So for that reason, I have to get hard money when I flip they are gonna be the bank instead of you getting a loan. So maybe the seller owns the home free and clear, meaning that they don't have a mortgage on it. And instead of you buying the house for say $300,000 and getting a loan from the bank in order to fund it, you go to the seller and you say, hey, why don't you become the bank? Why don't you make the interest that the bank would have made if you don't have a use for that 300,000? So I might be able to go to the seller and give them 6% interest, which would beat whatever they were gonna get with that money. And for me, I'm able to buy the property and not have to worry about getting a traditional loan because more than likely the seller's not going to run my credit or worry about it. The seller's just going to worry about what price they're getting, what kind of down payment you're going to give them, what kind of interest rate, and how long they need to hold the loan for. And the beauty of seller financing is that you can negotiate all terms. Everything is negotiable. So when you go into it, just realize what are the most important aspects for you when you're negotiating. Is it a low down payment? Is it a lower interest rate? 
Are you willing to pay a higher interest rate so that you can get a lower down payment? Maybe you're even willing to pay a higher purchase price so that you can get better terms on your financing. I've structured deals in so many different ways when it comes to seller financing in order to give the seller what they want for their needs and then give me what I want for my needs. In fact, I did a YouTube video going over how I overpaid $100,000 for three different properties in Vegas. But because I got such great seller finance terms with 0% interest, with a low down payment, and everything else, I was able to wholesale that package of properties and make $90,000. And by the way, if you have no idea what wholesaling is, definitely subscribe to this channel because I've talked about it a lot and done multiple videos on the subject. But the point is, seller financing is a great way to own real estate if you do not have good credit. Now, I also mentioned subject to financing. What subject to means is you are going to take over the seller's mortgage. So let's say in this scenario, we have the $300,000 home and the seller has a mortgage on it for $290,000. Well, if you got a loan yourself with your own bank, you would go and buy the property for 300 and the seller would end up netting $10,000. That's because their original loan was 290,000. But what if instead of you having to get a loan, you say to the seller, look, let's keep your loan in place. I'll still give you the $10,000. That way I don't have to go through the process of doing this and you still get the same amount you would have got. For the seller, there are multiple pros and cons to this. For one, the loan is in their name, so it's on their credit report, not yours. And if you do end up defaulting, then they are going to be at risk. But the pro for them is that you could close right now really quickly because you don't have to worry about getting a loan. You're just giving them $10,000. The other benefit for the seller is they could potentially get more money. From my perspective as a buyer, if I had to choose between getting my own loan and paying $300,000 for the property, or taking over the seller's loan and paying $310,000 for the property, I would probably pay more for the property and take over their loan. In this scenario, the seller makes $20,000 by letting me do that versus $10,000 with letting me get my own loan. It's not gonna work for every seller in every situation, but if you could find the right person who doesn't mind it, then you will be able to get a property regardless of what your credit is. And I own many subject to properties that I've either flipped or kept as rentals. Another way to buy real estate with bad credit is through JVing with other people. So let's say that you have bad credit and you don't know how you're gonna buy this house. And by the way, this applies to not only bad credit, but if you have no money or other resources. But you find this really good deal and you say, hey Ryan, I want you to buy this house, but I wanna partner up with you. I know that you've got money and you've got credit and the ability to get loans. So you go get the loans and all that stuff and I will bring you the deal and do all the work and everything with the house. From my perspective, as somebody who's getting the loan for this person and letting them do all the work, it can make a lot of sense depending on what the JV terms are. If we're gonna go flip this house together and make $100,000 and I get to get half of that profit for just getting the loan and funding it, I'm totally down to do that. Maybe we wanna keep the house as a rental and cash flow it. I'm also open to that if the numbers make sense from my perspective. But just realize if you're watching this video and you've got the bad credit and you don't have the resources, you can still JV with somebody as long as you can bring value. And the best way to bring value in real estate is by finding a good deal. The truth of the matter is finding people with good credit and a lot of money is super easy when you have a good deal. A lot of people who apply to join my coaching program always have the false belief that they need all this money or they need all this good credit before they can find a good deal. And I always tell them that that is the absolute opposite of what you should be doing. Go out and find a good deal and the money and the credit will find you. I can promise that. And by finding that good deal, you're now gonna build up your own money. But if you try to build up your money or credit on your own without using real estate and without trying to go JV with other people or partner with them, you're gonna have a really tough time. Leveraging other people's money and other people's credit is the easiest way to grow your own wealth today. And if you wanna to apply to join my coaching program, you can go to futureflipper.com. I personally coach people in my all-star program. We also have a rookie program for people who are just getting started. But do not be one of those people who thinks you gotta have great credit or a lot of money to start. You just gotta be really good at finding deals. Another way to buy real estate with no credit is by getting an option on the property. Basically, how an option works is you would go to the seller and say, hey, 
I want to buy your property at a future date for this price. So maybe you say, hey, I want to lock in a price of $300,000 and I have the option to exercise it within the next two years. Well, maybe you want to buy it with conventional financing, but you know you don't qualify today because of your credit. Well, a year from now, maybe you are ready to qualify and the market has gone up. That same house is now worth $350,000. So you can exercise your option at that point when you're ready to buy and then purchase the home when your credit is good enough. I've used options before and they're a really great way to lock in a price today, especially in a hot market when things are appreciating. Another way to buy houses with bad credit is simply just using your own cash. If you're watching this video, that's probably not you. You're trying to figure out how you could buy a property without using credit or without using cash. But if you have cash, credit doesn't really matter. And in fact, there are a lot of loans you can get that if you put a big enough down payment on, they will not run your credit, they don't really care. And that's because you're putting so much down that they feel comfortable with your success in paying those payments. But those are just a number of ways you can buy houses with no money and no credit. As I mentioned before, the biggest thing you need to realize is finding deals is gonna lead to the money and the credit coming. Okay, so let's just take me, right? I'm a real estate investor. Um, I need more credit to yes. go fund my house flips, to fund marketing, mm -hmm. to, to fund my business. What would you tell me is the first step? So the first thing that we'll look at is we'll see how your business is structured. So we'll, assuming, let's just say LLC, because that's yep. you know one of the terms that people just know the most. Uh, it's the mo most common one. So we'll see, okay, do you have an LLC? You have a, our EIN. Do we have any business credit already established? So we'll take a look at your Dun & Bradstreet. So we'll take a look at your paydex score, which is your Dun & Bradstreet score. Ranges from one to 100. So anything over an 80, it's good. We'll take a look at your Experian, Equifax, same thing. Anything your over done 80, one is for uh, business, right? Uh, your Duns is for your business, and that's through uh, Dun & Bradstreet. So that's that's a number that you get with Dun & Bradstreet, which is the largest business credit bureau. Okay. And so we'll also take a look at your personal credit because in order to actually get into the game, especially if you don't have any business credit established just yet, you want to have at least a 680 personal credit score. That's going to at least allow you to get access to some form of funding, again, whether it's a personal loan or a business loan or a, a business credit card of some sort. Got it. Okay. So they're basically looking at your personal credit and your business credit Correct. when you go for business. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Especially when starting out, because yeah. there's really three pillars that banks are going to look at, especially as your business starts to grow naturally. That's going to be cash flow. That's going to be credit. And that's going to be collateral. Usually at the beginning, it's going to be cash flow or credit. And that credit is usually going to be on the personal side. Once you start to scale and you have some properties under, let's say, your business that you're holding, at that point, they can take a look at that 3C or the 3rd C, which is going to be collateral. Okay. So they'll look at your houses as collateral? That's what you're they saying? They can take a look at your houses as collateral. Um, they can take a look at vehicles as collateral, assuming they're under the business name. Um, and that's known more as secured funding. That's a bit more what we call down the road. But that is an option that a lot of business owners can tap into. They just don't know how. Right. I've been up early, dude. You know, I've been waking up at uh, 4.30 lately for the past uh, maybe like two months. Part of that was to start golfing earlier because I wanted yeah. to get better at golf. But, you know, lately um, at the end of the year, I've been uh, trying to prep for 2023 because, you know, we changed our company names. So Future Flipper became Wealthy Investor mm. and... Um, you know, Content Empire became Wealthy Creator, Love and that. I had to create a whole new course, you know, for that. Um, we totally revamped our parent company. Like, we're just doing so many revamps that I have to get done right before the year. Yeah. And... Um, gotta meet the deadlines. Yeah, gotta meet the deadlines. And so, you know, it's like, well, do I just wake up super early and do it? Or, you know, am I gonna work late at the office and miss... Uh, hanging out the kids. I'm like, well, I guess I'll just wake up at 4.30. And like this morning I was filming our new course at 6 a.m. I saw that on your story. Yeah, yeah. filmed the course at 6 a.m. And now I'm talking to you and I had some coaching calls. And after this, I got to go get back to filming. Like yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. You got to hustle. Got to gotta hustle. And so what's what's your schedule usually like? Um, Typical schedule today, you know, I'm not usually filming a brand new course, but uh, you know, I'll wake up at 4.30. I'll spend an hour and a half on my morning routine, just praying, uh, reading my Bible, um, using my Wealthy Way planner, just showering, getting ready. Then usually from six to seven, I work out. Then I will, if I'm if I'm golfing, you know, go from like seven to eight thirty or something. Go mm -hmm. practice golf, whatever. Go home, 
get showered, whatever, and then head to the office. Yeah. So th- that would be a, a typical day. Right now it's cold. So yeah. <laughs> it feels good out here though. Compared yeah. To Florida. Yeah. So uh, we're not golfing too much right now. So that's also too why I'm able to go do this because I'm like, well, it's too cold to golf. The course isn't even going to open because they have uh, what's called frost delays. Mm. So if if it's cold in Vegas, they won't let you play because the grass is um, it's like frozen. It's, it's frozen. Yeah. yeah, and so it'll ruin the grass if you drive on it and stuff. Yeah, it'll just patch it up. Yeah, so I can't even play in the mornings, but I don't want to like wake up <laughs> later. So I'm like, all right, well, I guess we're gonna go do stuff. Yeah, that yeah that four thirty hour is is clutch, especially like at this point I've I was already waking up early. But I have to already be up early with one of the kids is crying. Right? Oh yeah. So the nanny isn't is for those wondering the nanny isn't there twenty four like twenty four hours. I'm thinking like you know we're thinking about having another kid soon and um, I'm like man I think we need one of those night nurses. <laughs> night nurses yeah night nurses would be ideal. We originally wanted one of those but we just said you know what let's just get them on a routine. So I mean our kids are asleep by seven all of them, and they're not up until like five. But I'm already up at five. Mm. I'm already up at five. So we'll you know give them that first bottle. And I'm out to the gym. Yeah. 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 We, uh, dude, if, if we had triplets, if my wife's watching this, she would be like, <laughs> yo, I need two night nannies. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. So you don't feel like one nanny's enough for, for two kids you, that you guys have? No, one nanny's totally fine for two. I'm okay. like, dude, four kids a bit. It's a lot. It's a lot. And <laughs> I, I would always say jokingly, like we, we originally wanted, you know, two kids before having four. Uh, because I just thought to myself, you know, two kids or three kids in, in 2023 adjusted for inflation would be like having seven kids <laughs> in, in, in 94. You better you better help people get a lot of credit, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you got some bills coming up. <laughs> it's going to be fun. I, I got the full sales floor with these guys already building them in. Yeah, they're going to be making cold calls here soon. <laughs> if somebody's doing arbitrage right, like, I mean, they obviously got to get the down payment. They got to get, or not the down payment, um, the security deposit, right? And probably first month's rent. Um, how do you teach people to like come up with that money and like the furnishings and all that stuff? So we're a big fan of using business credit. Um, and a lot of people say, well, how do you get business credit? You haven't had a business for two years and there's two ways about it. You either personal guarantee it or you build up your business paid score using net 30 accounts, so-and-so. Yeah, and even if it'll take a little bit longer, like even if it'll take a few months to actually build up your paydex score so that you have that business credit, you can do it that way. But if you have good personal credit, you can always personal guarantee. And like right after you make your LLC, normally when you personal guarantee, you can get a business credit card like that. And so even me and Bryson like have over, in total, probably over $250,000 in business credit. And we're 20 years old. And so what we take, we literally teach people all the time. Like, you know, if you just, if you have good personal credit, you can automatically personal guarantee it if you want to. And then, it, or you could just go strictly like business credit and do that to, for your, you know, secure. Cause even a lot of the portals for paying your rent, you can pay with a credit card. So we tell them like, you can pay your security deposit, your first month's rent, mm. all of your furniture. And that's the majority of your startup cost. And you, you, you did it without using any of your own money. Yep. And then I remember a story about you and your wife when you first started the 0% interest credit cards. Yep. We preached that like, if you can go get that 0% interest offer for eight to 12, 18 months, yep. furnish the thing, pay the security deposits, let the Airbnb profit, pay it off. After it's paid off, you just have a, a cash machine. Yeah. yeah. And normally it breaks even well before you would ever start paying interest on those cards. So let's say it's like 12 month, no interest or 15 month, no interest. Normally break even time is like anywhere between probably like three to eight months. So most like it's, it's pretty solid. Yeah. Well, I think even for me when I got started, right, I didn't have a lot of money. And so I got those 0% cards and um, totally I, I, I made more than break even by using those cards. But Even um, once I hit the threshold where I had to start paying interest, I looked at it and I was like, well, by keeping the money out, I'm going to make more money than the interest, right? So I'm still going to run it back even with the interest. (laughs) Like, I don't care. And my credit score was like 500-ish for many years because, yeah, because I was just like, I don't care. Oh, Uh, yeah, because your utilization was high. Yeah, it was just my card was always maxed out. I was just like, I don't care. Like, I'm making money. And I'd get these e- or the, the, the car or the uh, letters every month like, hey, you want to consolidate your debt? We could do debt forgiveness. And I'm like, I got money. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> You're like I could pay it off. Yeah. I just don't want to. Yep. And I just think there's this stigma, you know, and I think guys like Dave Ramsey and stuff kind of give credit a bad name. They're like, oh, credit cards are bad. And I'm like, credit card is no different than getting a mortgage or getting a private loan or 
it's all the same. It's money that's not yours. <laughs> yeah, you just have to know how to manage it, just yeah. like anything else. But yeah, and leverage it. Like it's a difference between investing 10k to an Airbnb versus going to Saks Fifth and buying 10k worth of clothes that won't make you any money. Mm hmm. Hundred percent. Yeah, and I think you know, even as much as I always like uh, kind of make fun of Dave Ramsey, it's definitely there are people that are not entrepreneurial minded and they just can't control themselves with credit cards. And it's like. Yeah, credit card is, is not good for that person. <laughs> you know, um, back to the credit side of things. Um, what do you see happening? Like, do, are, is the credit market tightening up with the recession? How's that going? Yes, great question. So it is tightening up. We're starting to see lenders ask for a few more docs on the business side. Um, but that that's fine. You could work around that. It's happening more so on the personal side, where some of the some of the lines that you'd be able to get on a credit side would be like 25 k now you'll be lucky to get maybe 10. Uh -huh. And then even if you have the credit, a lot of them go back in and, and they'll, they'll do like an automatic underwrite and they'll they'll just go ahead and drop some of your limits, which happens more on the personal side than the business side, which is why we always tell our clients build business credit even when you don't need it, especially going into uncertain markets like 2023, where you'll turn on the channel on one side, they'll say, hey, market's going to boom. You'll turn on the channel on the other side and you know that finance expert would say, hey, get ready, you know, pinch your pennies. Yeah. That makes sense. A lot of uncertainty in the market. I mean, what do you think? You know, it's so hard to say. Um, I, I did not think that we would get to this point of where we're at. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't think they would raise rates to these levels this quickly. And, you know, they, it sounds like they're still not done. And yeah. so I'm just like, I don't know, man. You know, I don't like what I'm seeing as far as mm -hmm. um, for everyone. Right. For me. I always say this to, to our students, like the transition is the hardest part, right? Mm -hmm. So as we transition into this new market and, you know, you, you got to just deal with the uncertainty. That's the hard yeah. part. But once you start coming out of the other side, that's when you're like, okay, finally, we've bottomed out. Like now <laughs> things are, let's roll. We know where things are headed. Yeah. So right now, I, I think right now is the hardest part for whether you're a real estate investor or, you know, even if you're in business, you're, you're having to adjust now. Because yeah. people are, like you said, going to be tighter with money. Mm -hmm. There's going to be less, um, you know, things happening, less mm -hmm. transactions overall. So, you know, I, I just think it, it's hard to say what's actually going to happen. Now, if you ask me about the real estate market, I do not foresee it like crashing by any means. No, me either. No, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I see it continuing to just slowly, you know, kind of go down and then it's eventually flatline. And then, you know, once... They lower rates again because they're going to have to at some point. Then I see it just starting to go back, back up. up again. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. Even even over there in Orlando, like the market still, you look at some properties and they're, they're just still holding value. So that $600,000 house as of yesterday was like six twenty five. dollars So it's still going up. Yeah, and every market's different. <clears throat> like at the end of the day, um, <laughs> the thing is, if, if you would have bought stocks or crypto six months ago, 12 yeah. months ago, uh, you know, they're, they're down yeah, like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the best companies in the world are down 50%, yeah. 70%, right? Bitcoin's down, you know, 70% from its peak. Like, yeah. you know, it's just, they haven't really held, but real estate, even though, yeah, right now it's slow. I'm glad my money was in real estate yeah. versus, versus those things. Crypto. Yeah. I mean, and even then in uncertain markets, certain markets, whoever knows how to make money, whoever has a game plan behind it, they're going to be able to make money regardless of where the market is. Right. Especially in a down market because there's more people exiting the market. So now there's more market share. Yeah. I mean, I always tell people <clears throat> like, dude, this is such a big opportunity to go out and get better employees because yeah. companies are going to be laying people off. This yeah. is a great opportunity to get deals. It's a great opportunity to, you know, for us in 2023, we're going to acquire companies. Mm -hmm. Great time to do that. So, man, there's a lot. There's going to be a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We might have to acquire the credit company, dude. You guys are going to have to. You're going yeah. to have to get some funding for some of these companies. Yeah. For all the growing you guys are going to be doing. Right. Well, I'm saying the credit company for all the people I know are going to need credit. Yeah. Like that's that's a big business. That is a big business. You would know. <laughs> I'm in that. Listen, I'm in that. So whether somebody's a startup, I think, what, what was the number on it? Like 5 million, right? I'm having in front of me, but like 5 million new startups, like brand new businesses in 2022 alone mm -hmm. and, and counting. Right? right. Not including some of the mergers, not including some of the people that are already in business, which it's it's exciting, man. I think, you know, yeah, 2020, you know, things happened. But I think a lot of people realize that one source of income is too close to none. Mm. 
Yeah, it could be wiped out tomorrow. It could be wiped out tomorrow. Right. So explain to me why you have 50 credit cards. Like, what am I looking at? Yeah, and so, I mean, I this is something that's relatively new to me. You know, I got my first business credit card um, about two years ago. My first business card limit was a $5,000 limit, mm -hmm. um, incredibly small. Um, but I was able to um, really understand the internal bank rules of the underwriting teams at these top banks. And by reverse engineering it, I realized that we can optimize our personal credit profile, build very strategic bank relationships, um, and optimize the way we're applying for these credit cards to maximize the cards we're getting. So I went from zero business cards to getting approved for a half a million dollars in credit in just over one year. So That's crazy. very, very fast. And and uh, it's, I want to emphasize for everyone listening to this, this is possible for so many people. I didn't have an aged business. I didn't even have a cash flowing business. I was doing this with new businesses, yeah. um, with, with a credit file that didn't have a crazy amount of age. But, you know, when you look at the five factors of your, your credit score, every single section you can optimize. If you're short on age, you can add authorized users. If you don't have a diversified credit mix, um, there's ways you can get pledge loans where it reports a 95% off paid installment loan, which ultimately helps you get more credit. Um, and when it comes to the limits on your personal side, it's all about comparable credit. So if you have higher limits on the personal side, you can get higher limits on the business side. Mm. And so when I recommend personal credit cards for people to apply for, there's two reasons, two main reasons why you want to get specific personal credit cards. One is building the relationship with that specific grade A bank, like Chase, US Bank, American Express, Bank of America. I'm also applying for the personal cards that give high limits. Because if you can get a card at a grade A bank like Chase and the other, other ones I just listed, that also gives you a high limit. Not only are you building a relationship with that bank, so by the time you apply for a business credit card, they're going to give you more money, but also because you have that higher limit, other banks are going to see that and give you a higher limit also. Okay, let me pull out my cards. I'll show my favorite. Okay. So the Amex Business Gold is my favorite because it's 4X, 4X, um, 4X points per dollar spent on gas and dining, also for advertising. You guys probably use this yep. card, 4X on gas, dining, and advertising. Uh, yep, so anytime I'm, I'm doing gas and dining, I'm always doing this. Um, the Business Inc. Preferred, this is a Chase card. This is 3X on travel. And so I'll use this for, uh, for my travel expenses. Um, and then the Chase Freedom Unlimited is 1.5X on everything. Right. So, you know, going to the grocery store, getting haircuts, things like that. Um, but those three are my favorite when it comes to my daily spending. Um, so by far my favorite business credit card, that's a 0% card, um, is going to be the Chase Business Inc. Unlimited. And I love this card the best because it's, it's 0% for 12 months. And by the way, the 0% interest that we're talking about is for the introductory period. So sometimes that's low as six months. Sometimes it's long as 20 months. Like on this business platinum right here, it's 0% for 20 months. And this is a 50K card. Right. So just imagine, you know, having an extra 50K that you can borrow for free for 20 months. Do yeah. that for four cards. Yeah, you do that to start K. your business. I mean, dude, exactly. I mean, that's what I did in my business. And it was so game changing. Yeah. So um, the Chase Business Inc. Unlimited, that card is consistently giving out 50 to 75K limits. Uh, but it's super important. Like when you apply for these cards, there are certain things you want to make sure you're doing. And there's different ways you can apply for these cards. You can apply for them in person, you can apply for them in branch, or you can use a relationship manager. Um, so over my couple years on this, on this credit journey, I've been very fortunate to build very strong relationships with relationship managers um, at these high-level banks. Um, these are not individuals that generally hang around the branches, but they facilitate uh, very wealthy people when they get credit cards. And so there's a different process of submitting applications through these individuals. Essentially, these applications through the relationship managers go to the underwriting team. So mm -hmm. it takes a couple of weeks for, for them to give a decision, but it's actually a human looking at your application instead of like going in, into the branch or online. It's just a computer algorithm. Automatically just exactly you whatever. So if you go into a branch, like there's a very, very, very low chance you're going to get a 50K approval. I've actually never seen it. Why? If you, um, it's just, it's just the underwriting process. So if you, if you want the high limit personal, if you want the high limit business credit cards, you have to use a relationship manager. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It, it is a night and day difference. Well, like, I, and I know this is true at my banks. Like I have, I, I guess they call them relationship managers or the wealth managers. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they definitely do things for me that they don't do for normal people. Exactly. So you have to get access to those, to those people. Got it. Yep. So, Okay, you, you do that to apply. Um, one thing I think about is 
in the different industries, figuring out what's best. Like you mentioned with e-com, um, the plum card is great because yep. you can wait 60 days, you get one and a half percent, um, and it's going to scale up as your e-com score or e-com store scales. Um, but it's probably not great for real estate, you know, because if I'm trying to go take 50 K to go fund maybe a deal or marketing or whatever, I can't really do that with the plum card for sure. Yeah. Cause the plum card, you have to pay back in 60 days. The other American express charge cards, you have to pay back in 30 days. Um, so, I mean, you can use any revolving or any 0% interest business card for real estate. So tell me about business credit. Like how's that score determined? Is it like personal? Um, it's quite easy to get business credit scores. Um, so basically to get a DNB paydex score, you need three vendor trade lines to report. And so we recommend three of the easiest ones to, uh, to get reporting. Once you have three, you're going to have an 80 paydex score. At that point, you can start working on your trade lines that, uh, to report to experience small business. Um, it's not a very hard thing to do. It's a bit tedious. Um, but we, you know, we walk step by step through it. Yeah. And it's basically once you get those scores, perfect. And then we, we move on. Um, and that will help you get higher limits. Right. Okay. I mean, what? And yeah, go on. I was going to say another thing that's cool um, is there are ways to get auto loans where, because there's specific banks that you can get auto loans for where they don't actually verify that you use the money for an auto loan. Some banks verify, other banks don't. So I just got approved for a 35K um, auto loan. It's 5% interest over a 60 month term, um, but they don't actually verify that I used it for a car. Somebody else was telling me that. Um, yeah. I don't even remember who it was, but I was like, really? That's interesting. Super interesting. Yeah, there, there's incredible things you can do. And um, when, it, when it comes to diversifying your credit mix or just increasing your score in general, something I just did a couple weeks ago, which brought me from an 800 FICO to an 826, um, it's, an, it's, uh, it's called a pledge loan. So Navy Federal is a credit union. Um, you can do um, a pledge loan against your savings account, which gives you uh, a certain amount of money, whatever, whatever you're borrowing in collateral, and then you pay it off 95%. So now on your credit profile, it shows a 95% off uh, paid off installment loan. Mm. Yeah. So that's going to help me get more credit and help me boost my score to 826. Mm. Yeah. I think it was Navy Federal that they were telling me about that auto thing. I can't remember. But um, yeah, I mean, dude, the whole world of credit is just like, insane like how it just much. fascinates me man more you can borrow more you can borrow. how does it work with with you guys do you just take a percentage of the credit you raise or like what how does that work yeah so on those we show our clients from a to z how to do it um, so they do it you guys don't yeah, do it yeah we structure for them how to do it so one of the reasons why we did it this way is just transparently you know tr being transparent is i just didn't want to deal with the headaches of having to go in there you know, having to get uh, power of attorneys so that we can go in there and do all the funding, go to the banks and apply for our clients. So what we did was, hey, this is the exact process that we do. These are the relationship managers that, managers that we do business with. We're going to introduce you to them. Um, and this is the exact process. These are the cards that we would go for given your business. These are the loans we would go for given your business. This is what we would clean up on your business. So maybe if your business is in a high industry or a high risk industry, would say, hey, you may want to change it from, we just did this last week. We had a client, couldn't get funding. Um, he was able to get $125,000. He wasn't trucking, but his LLC had the, the name trucking in it. So it was like ABC trucking. That's going to raise a red flag with the lenders. So we said, They don't hey, like trucking? They don't like trucking. We had him change it to logistics. <laughs> and so when we had him change to logistics, because it's more broad, he was able to tap into that capital. Wow, I'm surprised. Trucking's like, it seems pretty safe to me. <laughs> you'd think it you'd, you'd think it would but logistics it, it's it's more uh, generic and so yeah. the more generic a name could be like having real estate on an llc as well that yeah. can also raise a red flag and yeah. so it's better to just have it let's say example ryan panetta enterprises right as an example uh you can take that route especially when you're starting out obviously when you're some of the bigger dogs that doesn't matter as much but when you're starting out you're trying to bend the rules as much as you can yeah no that makes sense i um I've thought about that. I remember when I was really trying to do this, like when I was first getting started, yeah, I would always come up there like, yeah, we don't really like house flipping. It's pretty risky. And That's I'm like, why. yeah, you know, it is pretty risky. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if, if you're in real estate for everyone that's listening to this, which is I'm sure it's a large audience on the real estate side, management, management, management's going to be the go-to with real estate. You can do consulting, but we like management. So consulting and management and logistics tend to be but you would still keep you real use. estate out of it. You would still keep real estate out of it. I'd be like Pineda Management. Pineda Management, Pineda Consulting, uh, Pineda Logistics. So for e-commerce, 
Mm-hmm. Panita Logistics. We're not Got doing it. Panita e-commerce. E-commerce is another one. Why do you think so many Stripe accounts get shut down when they run it through like uh or, or like like e-commerce usually gets shut down through Stripe because Stripe doesn't like the high risk. What about e-learning? Do they? Like no, that? that's fine because that that goes back to cons- uh, consulting. I'm sure they don't like NFTs. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> if if you do a financial advisor investments, that'll that'll get you flagged for sure. Financial advisor will get you flagged Somet- too. Yeah. What are the industries that are okay? Like Again, every- consulting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> consulting, management, <laughs> logistics. So everyone's you, a consultant, a manager of <laughs> logistics. Because management, so management is one of those things where it's like an umbrella, right? So there's 32 subcategories like in the NAICS with real estate. You'll have an NAICS code for real estate appraisal or appraiser. You have one for land developer, which is terrible. Yeah, you'll, that you'll, one would be risky. That one is awful. You'll have one for real estate agent, real estate broker. You have one from real estate surveyor, real estate management. Real estate property management is the go-to. Property management, safe. Safe. They like it. They love it. Yeah, they love it. And again, take it take it to a credit union. You can do the big banks, especially if you already have a relationship with the bigger bank, like a Chase, Bank of America. But um, but your smaller banks is definitely the go-to. Got it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, you're talking about getting big loans with these people. How big of credit lines can you get? Because that seems to me like the best option, right? On um, Like loans, lines, or just everything put together? Well, I'm just saying credit lines would be like the simplest, right? Like credit cards is the simplest. That's usually where everyone starts. So term that's usually out there is like credit stacking, yeah, right? Yeah. That, that just means that you get a bunch of credit cards, you know, five or six, you have a stack of them through applications that you fill out. Uh, that's one of the that's one of the methods. But then we also have additional funding frameworks in the inner circle where if you, let's say, wanted three business credit cards as your percent, so see those kind of like your Swiss Army knife at, let's say, 25K a pop. That's $75,000 right there. We would now work our way into, okay, how can we get some B-locks? So we had a client. He had only been in business for a year. He went to PNC, PNC Bank. It's a regional bank for you guys checking this out. And he was able to get $100,000 of a business line of credit not including what he had already on business credit cards. Right. And so all they asked for was what, one year tax returns? Because okay. the common misnomer is, oh, I need to be in business for five years. I need to have crazy cash flow. I need to have 50 employees. You just got to be set up right. Right. You have to set up right. You have the LLC, you have the EIN, articles of organization in your business bank account, in your personal credit 680 or higher. You can you can do some damage. Mm. So I, I was, I was going to I was gonna go there. So if the first place that you'd want to start is you want to take a look at all of your all of your information on your personal credit profile. So you want to print out, I'm old school, right? We'll print them out because we want to highlight, print out a copy of your Experian report, of your TransUnion, your, uh, TransUnion report, and of your Equifax report. Those are the all three personal credit bureaus. And then you want to see, okay, is there any information on here that's not matching? So that'll be my name. That'll be my last name. That'll be my address. You want to get all of your uh, credit reports matching where you have one name, one address, one employer, and one phone number on there. You then go in and you suppress what's the secondary bureaus. A lot of people don't know this. They think it's just the main bureaus. So you have the secondary bureaus, which is CoreLogic. So if you're trying to get rid of an eviction, it's going to be over at CoreLogic because that's who's hosting all of your real estate data. If you've been arrested, if you have any criminal records, if you have any evictions, foreclosures, and then you want to pretty much suppress that by going on their website, pretty much saying, hey, I don't want you guys giving my information off to the the credit bureaus. You wouldn't do that with SageStream. um, And then you want to do that with ARS. So that's just a simple way. At that point, once you get that back, you've suppressed that, you then start to send out dispute letters. Mm. And the dispute letters are what gets everything removed. Dispute letters are what gets everything removed because you're using the FCRA, Fair Credit Reporting Act, to your advantage. We're protected as consumers. And so as long as you know, as long as you're checking out Section 609, you're, you're, you're fine. I've seen a lot of people who clean up your credit. Like, what's that typically cost? I don't want to do it. I don't have time to write dispute letters. It, so it depends. It can vary from $500 flat fee. Some people do a subscription model 97 a month, like a Lexington Law. I mean, you can charge flat fee 2500 bucks. Yeah, and they'll just, they'll, you'll clean up everything. Yeah, they'll go in there. They'll remove the inquiries. They'll remove the collections, charge-offs, you know, any any. So that would just help raise negative. my credit scores. Yeah. So the, the main thing is, as you're removing a negative, you want to add a positive. So if I'm removing a collection... I'm adding a personal credit card or I'm having someone add me as an authorized user. So let's say mom, dad, sibling, wife has better credit than us. We'll have them add us as an authorized user in that history. So let's say American Express backdates it. And so now it'll look like you've had as an authorized user on that account, maybe 15 years of history. That's one of the ways that I first started building my personal credit 
which is my dad. He added me to his Bank of America personal credit card, AmeriCard. And it gave me maybe 125 point boost mm. because I was already taking things off of our credit. Right. And so having that, if you looked at my credit report at the time, it would say like eight years on there. And that right. was like the first line that was on there. I got to keep learning the tricks of the trade so that we can help people get more capital to start, you know, rocket fueling their business. I got Andrew and Bessie with me. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Thanks, Ryan, for the yeah. introduction. <laughs> All the way from uh, New Jersey? Yeah, New Jersey. Yeah, born and raised. Couldn't tell by the accent, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no New Jersey accent here for this guy. Yeah. So, dude, you're in credit. How long you been doing this? Yeah, just a little over two years now. Okay. And what what made you even get into this whole business credit game? Because I see it popping up as like a big industry. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I saw from, you know, outside looking in about two years ago. I was, you know, getting myself involved in programs online and, you know, quickly went broke, as you just mentioned, like two minutes ago, right? And I found an opportunity that, you know, I thought that was actually going to be a really good fit for me. And it happened to be a really good fit for me. Um, where I was going to, you know, learn some really good skills online and sales and marketing, but I was out of money to pay for the mentorship. So someone had introduced me to, you know, getting access to credit um, and like these 0% offers in order to actually pay for the program. And so, you know, no one around me taught me this. Like I didn't really grow up in a family of entrepreneurs or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of on my own online trying to figure things out on my own. And someone had brought the idea to me. So, you know, got around $30,000 of credit cards, invested in the opportunity, um, started developing some skills, started making some more money. Um, and then, it, you know, eventually I saw other people in the credit space and it kind of lit a light bulb in my head, you know, as I was developing these sales skills, these marketing skills, these, you know, business organization skills and thought, well, this is something I'm I've already done myself. I'm starting to help other people who want to enroll into this program that I'm in. I'm helping them do this too. You know, why don't I help people on a much larger scale? It seems like something I'd be really happy to do. So then it became its own business. And uh, yeah, we've been able to help, I think over like 400, 500 people so far. Mm. How much credit do you think you've gotten for people to this point? <laughs> it seems like now probably nearly 10 million. Yeah. Because, I mean, it seems like every single week um, with like my relationship managers, they're sending me approvals. And I mean, each week, I mean, I'm seeing like at least 500,000, like $600,000 of total approvals every week. And this has obviously been going on now yeah. for, you know, over a year now. So, yeah. So for those unfamiliar with my story, I give the two, two minute rundown of like why I'm such a big believer in credit. Um you know, I didn't have the capital to start flipping houses. And at the time I didn't have any private lenders and, you know, people that I knew with money. And so I was like, dude, if I'm going to flip a house, it's literally going to have to be me maxing out my credit cards. And there's, yeah. there's only one way to do it. And at the time I want to say maybe I had like 10,000 of credit, which still wasn't enough. And so I didn't have <laughs> a credit program or YouTube yeah. or anything. I was just like, I'm going to apply for every credit card under the sun in both my name and my wife's name. Yeah. And so oh, wow. we, we applied for every credit card and we ended up getting about $50,000 of credit. And most of it was all 0% credit for 12 to 18 months. And I was like, great, let's, you know, balance transfer these and, and, and get a check. And, you know, I ended up getting 50 K basically at 0%. And, um, that was what I used to fund my first couple of flips. And, you know, it changed my life. I ended up, uh, making 25 K on that first flip and we made 15 K on the second flip and you know, the rest is history. Dang, I, that's I, pretty sweet. Yeah. I've been borrowing money ever since. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Like just for me, when I started my consulting business, I only had about 20 K available and I just made like a big investment in something else. And so I really only had like 5 K in checking in my account. Yeah. And you know, I said to myself, like, oh, I got to make this happen. And, you know, I had that confidence in myself because I had like a lot of the skills I had previously invested with um, using 0% interest credit. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I just really worked hard at it. You know, just didn't give up. And then, you know, now, you know, I've gone from just like a one man team to having like 20 guys underneath me, um, you know, building now near an eight figure business. Mm. 
That's crazy, dude. And you guys are young, man. How old are you? 24. 24. Yeah. <laughs> and on the way to a eight-figure business, just helping people get credit. Pretty much, yeah. That's crazy. So walk me through the process because I've, I've interviewed other credit guys and they all have just different philosophies on how to go about getting people credit. I mean, when I started, um, I didn't know about business credit. I just simply went and got all these personal lines of credit. Uh, that's what I did too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So but tell me like what, what's kind of your guys' philosophy on credit? Yeah. You know, we, we definitely work with um, like a lot of people who want to get access to money fast and they also don't want to hurt their credit score either. So obviously the best way to do that is getting business credit that doesn't report to their personal credit report. Right. So, um, you know, we often don't really go through the whole like net 30 kind of vendor card stuff um, in our space, like in my company, just because we work with a lot of people that want to get their hands on money quickly. Right. So um, we often just take the fast approach of, you know, using personal credit score, right. To get approved for that, you know, business credit card. And, you know, many people may think like, oh, I need to use my personal credit to get the business credit card. Well, it's ultimately you who's, you know, borrowing the money. So the bank's going to want to look into you to make sure that you're going to be a, you know, good candidate to accept a business credit card from them. So what, I mean, if, if you're going to use your personal credit to go get business credit, I mean, what's the point of getting business credit? Why not just sure get personal credit? There's, there's a lot of good benefits to it because you're going to get higher limits than you would normally get on personal credit cards. You also have access to relationship managers and they could really help you get very high limits compared to what the algorithm may give you online for a business credit card. Um, you know, it's also something that's more so tied to your business than your personal credit report right now. Obviously, if you default on it, you know, there may be some consequences to your personal credit. However, if you max out a business credit card, um, it's not going to affect your personal credit. So um, really, it's only going to affect your relationship with that bank specifically. So say maybe you got a business credit card with maybe U.S. Bank or something like that, right? But then you wanted to go get um, a car loan with a credit union. Well, if you have $20,000 maxed out on that U.S. Bank card, it's not going to affect your ability to get a good rate on a car loan with some credit union, right? right. So it keeps you in a really good spot. So it even though you need your personal credit to qualify for that business credit, you're saying it's not going to impact it as you utilize it? That's correct. Yeah. Personal credit is going to be completely untouched if you're, you know, now there are some business credit cards, you know, like Discover, Capital One, TD Bank. Um, now, like if you max those out, you know, those often do report to um, personal credit score. So, you know, normally we stay away from those kinds of banks. Um, but most business credit cards, other than like those banks, um, if you max them out, you know, like a $30,000 limit, your personal credit score is not going to tank, mm -hmm. which is like super important because especially if you want to get more business credit cards, I've done this with a lot of people where they've came to me and they've had a maxed out business credit card and they question like, oh, well, will I still get approved for more business credit cards, even though this one business credit card's maxed out. And then we take a look at their personal credit. They have like 770 score or something like that. And they're still able to go to other banks to get approvals for more business credit cards because, you know, the bank's not exposing all too much money to this candidate already. Right. So um, you wouldn't necessarily want to go back to the same bank that's already exposing a lot of money to you at that current moment. But you'd want to go to another bank. Um where they're not necessarily going to see that when they look into your personal credit report, right? So when they pull your experience, they're not going to see that you have um, this twenty thousand dollars of debt. If they unless they really dig into like the small business financial exchange and like those business credits, but they're really, really looking mostly at your personal credit and your personal borrowing history. Mm, okay, yeah, because I remember when my um, personal credit was super maxed out. Um, it was in like the 500s, like yeah. low 500s. <laughs> yeah, and, I know what that's like. <laughs> yeah, and I honestly, I didn't care because I, I wasn't getting a car loan. I had a, a car paid for in cash and I, um, 
it was like, it wasn't an expensive car. It was like a $10,000 car. And I wasn't looking to buy rental properties or things like that. Cause I didn't even have a job. I couldn't get like, you know, a normal mortgage. And so I was like, look, the next two years, I'm just going to build my business and keep utilizing this cash over and over again. And I have 0%, so I don't really care. And I'm going to just yeah. keep it maxed out and whatever. That's what I did. I just didn't even try to like increase my credit. And I, sure. I, I knew that too. I couldn't even go really increase it because I still had the capital out, you know, working yeah. in a real estate deal. So I was kind of just like, I didn't care. Sure. You know, and, and that's definitely um like an approach that's totally something I've done myself, right? When I first started with like personal credit. And, you know, I think it's definitely something that, you know, if if you're in that similar situation like you and I were in where, you know, it didn't really matter, you know, I'm focused on building my business, right? Then all the power to actually do it. But also, you know, to keep in mind too, like say maybe you max out your cards, you've kind of reached the end of the road. Um, it's definitely also good to have that that business credit where, you know, maybe, oh, maybe you have to go get more business credit um, or else you have to get something called like a bridge loan where, you know, maybe you have someone who pays down your credit card debts for you so you could get more business credit. Say if you reach like an end of the road situation where now your score's in the 500s, you might not be able to get business credit or lending products. So, um, yeah, tell me, you were telling me this a little bit earlier. Tell me about bridge loans like, yeah. because I, you know, we hear about bridge loans for real estate. Sure. But you, you were telling me like bridge loan for these credit guys is really interesting. It is pretty interesting. Yeah. So, um, a friend of mine, uh, Curtis actually introduced me to this idea of bridge loans. And, um, when I was getting into the funding space, um, I only knew like a little bit about it and he was explaining to me how it was going to help obviously me bring on more people that I can help get funding for, which I thought that was a great idea because I wanted to help more people with this, right? It's something that's obviously benefited both you and I, you know, we both are huge advocates of credit and think it's, you know, super powerful when starting a business. So, you know, being able to help more people is super important to me as well. So the thing about a bridge loan, basically what it is, is that say someone has maybe $30,000 of credit card debt that's keeping their score maybe around like low to mid 600s, maybe even 500s, right? Um, they have like no late payments or, you know, derogatory marks, things like that. You know, someone like that can actually still get approved for business credit cards. However, they actually need to pay down their, their credit card debt first, right? Because the bank's going to pull their credit. They're going to say, oh, well, this person has um, too high of balances amongst his revolving trade lines, and they're just going to turn you down. So if you could find an actual person, this is not a debt consolidation loan, but if you could find an actual person who has money available to lend to you to pay down your cards, this is going to boost your score up and you could actually get approved for more credit. Mm -hmm. And this makes sense to do really on your personal credit cards, you can do it with business credit cards to get more business credit cards with the same bank, right? So maybe you have a maxed out Chase card and you want to get another Chase card, but you can't pay down that maxed out Chase card. Well, Chase isn't going to expose more credit until you pay down your existing debt that you owe to them. Mm -hmm. So you could find a bridge loan lender who has money available in their checking account to temporarily lend to you so you could pay down that card, allow the statement to come around, apply for another card, and then you know you could then pay back the lender using credit cards. So to recap this, it's it basically is, like, <laughs> yeah. uh, to your point, it's a bridge loan short term. Like, uh, I'll make this simple so everyone can understand. Like, I let's just say I have thirty k of credit maxed out. Um, well, actually, I'll, I'll use you. You have thirty k of credit maxed out. I have capital as a lender and my capital could have came from credit too. Right? Yeah. Uh, it could come from cash credit, whatever. Right. And I say, Hey, I'm gonna make this agreement with you. I'm gonna pay off your 30 grand of credit cards. Okay. For the next couple of weeks while your credit score adjusts to that payment, your credit's going to go up and then you're going to be able to apply for, you know, business lines and other things. Now that you have a good score. And then once those are approved, you're then, going to pay me back yeah. you know, with credit. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Got it. 
That is a, I, I've never heard that one, but I mean, the, it, to me, it's like, there's always just ways to like utilize money and debt and, and, you know, help accomplish people or help people accomplish their goals. But I would imagine sure. me as the lender, I'd want a pretty big amount because I'm kind of taking a risk that dude, yeah. like, what happens if you don't pay me back? Yeah. No, that's totally a risk to consider, right? I mean, you know, I've I've definitely seen, you know, some instances of that, but normally you run into to good people. I mean, genuinely people are often really good people out there. And as long as you set the expectations right and, you know, you're very strong on kind of like that initial call just as well, the we contract were, too. Yeah, the contract right before engaging in the business and the service, right? You're qualifying that person, making sure that they're a good fit to lend to right? Um, that's all very important. Um, but yeah, it often is a, a pretty high fee uh, associated with it. However, is ultimately like a bridge for you to get to, you know, that greater outcome, right? Because maybe say in your case, right, you made 25000 15000 from your first flips, right? But say maybe you weren't able to get approved for business credit, right? Maybe your score already was pretty low and you had maxed out cards, but you just found, you know, flipping houses, right? So, you know, you get a bridge loan and then you get approved for that 50,000, right? And now you're, you know, smooth sailing, right? So that fee almost, you know, if you're going to be able to accomplish that kind of result, right? What how, does that fee really matter? Because now look at the amount of success that yeah, you've no, been 100%. able to, Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, like I've said this all the time with hard money lenders and other things like, you know, people, um, when I was first getting in the industry, they were like, dude, you can't pay hard money lenders. These guys are loan sharks. They're, they're going to charge you crazy interest mm -hmm. and points and all this stuff. I was like, yeah, I mean, it kind of is what it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is what well, it is. Well, for me, I'm just like, it's a cost to doing business. And exactly. with even the, the credit cards, what happened was I had 0% interest for like 12, 18 months on just varying cards. And even after the 18 months, I still kept them maxed out, even though I was paying 20%. Yeah. Because I was like, well, I'm still making a lot more. So like, what do I care? And, yeah. um, you know, I think like with this, it's an interesting thing because to me, you just run the analysis of like, okay, well, how much am I going to get approved for by doing this? Right. So it's like, all right, I owe 30, you know, or you owe 30 and let's just say I was going to let you go borrow my 30 grand. It's high risk for me. And I'm like, bro, you're going to have to pay me five grand to do this. Yeah. Right. And you know, you, you go out there and you apply for these things now that your credit's good and you go get, you know, I don't know, 50, 100 grand of credit. It's like, dude, I would happily pay five grand to go sure. get access to another 50 or hundred because I know, I can make a lot more than five grand. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. No, you, you bring up a really good point there for sure. And then I know you also mentioned a little bit about kind of repercussions, things like that. I mean, you know, ultimately in the worst case scenarios, obviously never want to get to that point. It could get to the point of, you know, like small claims courts. It could get, you know, into like nasty legal stuff. It could get, you know, collection agencies after borrowers, right? You always want to avoid those situations, but um, that's like kind of the risk associated with the lender is, you know, when am I going to get my money back? Yeah. How long would it take for somebody to typically get their money back in that scenario? You know, in those scenarios, it could, it could be a very long time. Um, like which what's is a long time. It could be a couple of months. Uh, well, I guess walk me through, like, what's the typical time frame for somebody to go pay down their personal yeah. credit? Well, we, I was apply. just mentioning, yeah. In like the worst case scenario, right? Like, that's how long it could take. But typ typically bridge loans last no longer than maybe two, three, four, five weeks. So it takes a month for, you know, because you're going to have your payment or whatever reporting coming up, right? Exactly. So I'm going to pay that thing before reporting. Yeah. Then it's going to report that you've paid it off. Yeah. It's at then... that point the lender can ask for their money back. Like right. Confidently, safely, right? So there should, like right in a perfect world, there should be no issue having that repayment, right? And what how would they pay him back? They would just charge the card to like plastic or something? Um, you know, they could just charge the cards through a payment processor. So the lender can have a payment processor. Yeah, but set a lot up. of people don't have that. 
Yeah. No, yeah, no, a lot of people don't have that. However, it, it can be easily set up with, you know, Stripe, Stripe you know, payment processors yeah. so with banks. So I banks. would just Stripe you for 35 grand. Yeah. Yeah. And it just go right back on your personal credit. Yeah, exactly. And now the borrower, you know, say they had all this debt on personal credit at 20% interest, you know, now they're paying it back at 0%. So they've even saved some money there because maybe they were paying 20% per year on $30,000, right? That's about 5,000, 6,000 per year, mm-hmm. right? And you know, now you just did this bridge loan to go get approved for more 0% cards. You move all the balances to the 0% cards. Mm-hmm. Now you've actually saved yourself, you know, you're going to pay the the lender, right? But you've also now moved it to 0% cards too. Right. No, I, I've honestly, I've heard a lot of tricks and trades of credit. And that that's one that I never thought of. And I'm like, yeah, dude, if the, if the borrower was right, I would totally be a lender for that. That's yeah. like some good passive income. Well, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, no, it, like, and that's very important too, is just screening your borrowers, making sure that they're a good fit um, before, you know, lending them money. So that way you could avoid any kind of trouble with repayment, right? It's obviously something you have to acknowledge and be wary of when you're engaging in that kind of business. Um, but oftentimes it's pretty smooth as long as you're actually lending to the right people. Um, I've done this with maybe over a hundred people at this point and it's gone very smooth, maybe like one or two bad eggs I've seen, but you know, pretty consistently I've seen, you know, really good, really, really, really good outcomes as long as, you know, the screening process goes very well. Yeah. No, I like that idea. So what I'm curious too about with business credit or or just LLCs, like how long do you have to have an LLC and all that? Very good. I mean, typically it's best to have one open for a couple of months. However, um, there's nothing stopping you from getting approved for business credit, even with the business that's open, you know, for like one day. In fact, actually one of my top success stories inside my, my own funding program, um, he actually got approved for $228,000 of 0% interest business credit on an LLC that was not even like two weeks old. Right. So he had, you know, joined my program, you know, May 30th and by, you know, June 21st, all without starting with an LLC, he had Mm. $228,000 of available credit. Right. Yeah. So however, it's, it's definitely going to be a factor for the people who have, you know, like lower credit scores, um, who don't have the best credit profile. If they're giving the bank more reasons to say no, they're, you know, going to give the bank more reasons to say no. Right. But, you know, if you have really, really good credit and you're giving the bank very minimal reasons to say no with a brand new business, you know, you can still get approved for what what are the reasons banks say no? You know, there's, there's tons of reasons. It's going to be based on, you know, all the credit factors that, you know, add up to what make your credit score, right? Maybe it could be something with having a late payment or maybe some kind of, um, internal, kind of a thing that happened in the past. Maybe you had, you know, a charge off with the bank. Um, It could be, you know, too high of credit card utilization, right? Those are some basic ones, but some other ones that people might not, you know, think of are maybe you've opened up too many recent, you know, credit cards, Mm. right? Maybe also, you know, you've yeah opened too many accounts. Maybe you have too new of a business. Sometimes that's usually in the case of, you know, tougher biz, like, you know, newer businesses with lesser credit scores, you know, for their guarantor. Right. How, how much of a difference does it make for like your, how high your credit score is versus like your actual income? Yeah. Very good question. I mean, more so they are going to look at personal credit, you know, revolving trade lines. That's another thing too. Like if you're looking for an increase, this is why it's like really important to like make sure your personal credit is good at the same time, you know, wanting to get high approvals for business credit cards because the bank will look for comparable trade lines on your personal credit. So they'll look to see like, you know, what kind of credit limits other banks have already approved you for on your personal credit. So you know, that's definitely like important too. But back to like the income aspect of things, you know, income certainly going to matter. It'll certainly help you get a higher limit on a card, but um, they're really going to look at that 
personal credit borrowing history. You could have, you could be making five hundred thousand dollars a year, but if you have like a five fifty, like the banks, they, they don't like. They're, they're not gonna like. That's you. so dumb that like a broke person with seven hundred is better. I know it, it. It's very, it's very interesting. I've definitely seen a lot of cases where someone's making sixty thousand dollars a year with a eight hundred credit score get approved for more money than someone who makes four <laughs> times the, the amount. They, <laughs> then they make in a year. Yeah, like they're getting more credit than the money they make, and then the guy who yeah. actually makes a lot of money is not getting anything. I know it's it's crazy how it works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Uh, I I know this too. So I remember early on in my career, I was applying for business credit for my house flipping company, and every time the bank would do it, they'd be like, "So what do you do?" I'm like, "It's a house flipping business," and they mm. did not like that. Yeah, now that's like super important too. That's definitely something I run into a lot with people is. They have this idea of what they want to use the funding for. However, they also have to, you know, talk about the lower risk activities in which they're engaging in with their business. Because, you know, some of the things that you're doing besides just, you know, investing and flipping is um, you're also doing, you know, management. You're also providing like other services like within your business. Right. And you want to be able to go to the bank and have a really good story straight so that way you're not throwing yourself under the bus by saying something high risk and then they turn you away. I've seen a couple of people where they have some kind of, you know, very like risky kind of crypto forex website <laughs> online. Yeah. And the yep, bank I got a yeah. I got a super <laughs> forex crazy website. Yeah, yeah. And they've yeah, the bank just turned them around. They said, Yeah, we can't take you on as a client. So um I've definitely seen that. It's not fun when that happens, but um, that's why it's like so important to have a really strong story going into the bank. Um, that way you don't throw yourself under the bus. You know? Yeah. T typically like I'll go in there and say I'm a consultant, right? Which I am, I'm a consultant, right? But if I'm going in there talking about like credit, things like that, they may like that. They may not like that. Right. So, you know, I might as well stick with something a lot more. Being safe, a like consultant, consultant is a much better business than saying, Hey, I help oh, yeah. you get more credit. Oh yeah. I the help people figure out how to you know, <laughs> mess yeah. with the system. Yeah, yeah. You know, you'd be surprised though. A lot of a lot of relationship managers actually they know like what you're that. doing. Well, because they do, they're, yeah. they're they're making a ton. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, the it's that's why it's so good to get in touch with the relationship manager versus applying for things through the algorithm because um, with them they actually make money by giving you a card. The more that you spend on that credit card, the more money the bank makes. So the bank doesn't want to lend to someone who's going to max out a it. card and then, yeah, not churn through it, right? Spend and pay it back, spend and pay it back. That's what the credit card is for, right? But when you're holding on, like, sure, they want you to use 0%. They do want you to spend money on it. They do want you to carry a balance a little bit, but they also don't want you to be, you know, out all this money and not churning through the card. You know, the it's not just what's in it for, you know, that relationship manager, but what's in it for the bank too, because they're going to make money based on you spending on the card, you know, through those back end processing fees. And, you know, they also make money when you bring your checking account over, when you get into their other products, things like that. So they really, really, especially, you know, and it's a little bit weird times right now with what just happened last week, but the bank really wants your business and will attract you with a 0% offer. Mm. Yeah. Do you have any idea how these relationship managers get paid? Like, I mean, I know well, they get like a base, they get like a salary, but they get bonuses on, you know, the amount of spend that is generated on the card. They also make money, um, not just on the spend, but also like, you know, how many clients they're bringing into their ecosystem. Um, so those are like some, some major ways they do have like some, you know, kind of sales commission incentive, but you know, they also get paid obviously a salary too. Mm. Okay. So let's talk about this, this whole banking thing. Y you just mentioned it. Um, you know, I don't know when this episode is going to get released, but you know, recently Silicon Valley bank just, um, <laughs> went under. Crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like they, uh, you know, what's crazy to me is I I'm watching the bank and just the story develop. And I remember seeing it on like Friday or something. And, they're like, yeah, Peter Thiel's telling everyone to remove their money from Silicon Valley Bank. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, that's kind of like heartless. You know, like yeah. this bank has helped a ton of startup founders. They've been around for like 40 years and 
you know, a lot of Peter Thiel's investments, I'm sure, are in that bank, right? And then, yeah. you know, like a day later, they're basically like, yeah, Silicon Valley Bank's going under. Like, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're on a bank run and they're toast. And then the yeah. next day they're like, dude, what's going to happen to all these depositors? 98% of them don't have FDIC insurance. And you yeah. know, the next day they're like, all right, everyone's going to be made whole. And it was like the fastest developing thing ever. But I'm just like, dude, I mean, this bank was like 40 years old, had yeah. like $90 billion of deposits and they got hit with a bank run. And then yeah. Signature Bank ends up getting going under. And then I was reading mm -hmm. something about Credit Suisse today or whatever it's called. And I'm just like, yeah. what the heck is going on in the world? Yeah, it is pretty crazy. I mean, you know, nothing stays the same forever, right? So, you know, always got to be on your toes, you know, really just, you know, keep your money safe, right? You know, I mean, the FDIC insurance is really, you know, very powerful thing to have, especially too. But, um, but yeah, no, it, it's definitely a crazy situation that's happening right now. Yeah. I mean, what do you think is going to happen, I guess, in your industry, right? Because sure. I've thought about this a lot with, um, recessions, right? Sure. Um, it starts to become harder to get access to money. No, that's totally right. Yeah. I mean, that's where, you know, it's very important to, especially like right now, you know, say if there's someone out there watching this, like who has things like wrong with their credit, maybe they have a late payment, a derogatory mark, right? It's like super important to get that, you know, fixed because even during like the recession, it's kind of crazy what starts happening, right? Like, you know, people are losing their jobs, but also people want to start businesses. There's always people who want to start businesses, right? Mm -hmm. But it obviously is going to become harder to get access to credit, right? And, you know, you know, the banks are still going to give out credit. You know, they may not give as much or they may not, you know, kind of, they, they may tighten like their circle of people that they would lend money to, you know, maybe someone who would have gotten approved with uh, like a low 700 score. Maybe that threshold increases to a higher credit score, right? Um, however, yeah, that's why it's like super important. Just keep all, you know, your ducks in a row. Just make sure that your credit is really is what as good as what can be. Take care of it. Because if you are in that situation where you need to get approved, you know, you're going to want to make sure that, you know, your credit is in order, you know, to get that approval when the time comes, right? Yeah. No, a hundred percent. Like I, I think, um, you got to always be prepared. Like you're saying, I think that, um, things are going to get harder credit wise to get. I mean, uh, ha have you seen, you know, you've been doing it now for over two years. Um, the industry changed since when COVID, I mean, you get into it yeah. during the middle of COVID when money is being handed out like hotcakes. Yeah. And then now it's different. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, the banks are still lending a lot of money right now. I mean, even now, like, you know, it seems like every Monday, like one of my relationship managers sends me all these like new approvals from the weekend. You know, they're still looking to bring on new, new clients, especially with the frenzy. I know I've talked to a couple of bankers like the past couple of days and they're like, oh yeah, I've just been super busy with, you know, all the craziness that's going on, like bringing on new clients, like talking to new people, you know, all of that. Um, but yeah, no, it is it is going to be very interesting. Um, it's just going to tighten up, but it's, I wouldn't say it's going to be completely like non-existent. You know, people are still going to be able to get approved, but it's definitely going to be, you know, a little bit tougher, you know, just yeah. as the example before. So what would be your tips to somebody who is um, looking at getting more credit or some tips they can take? Yeah, I mean... You know, I think, and especially with what we mentioned just now too, it's like having relationship managers is going to be like super, super, super important because, you know, they're going to help you get approved than what you would be able to get on your own through the algorithm. Right. 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 And so yeah. what, I mean, when you do that, how do you get a relationship manager and like, instead of just applying on freaking whatever website? Yeah. A lot of it is just really like simple communication. Right. And, you know, you know, a lot of these relationship managers, you know, they're not, they, they bounce around from branch to branch. Sometimes, you know, they're not even available like in a branch, you know, you have to kind of go up the chain a little bit to get to them. And sometimes they're really hard to get in touch with because they're only going to work with businesses that do over one or $2 million a year. Right. So, you know, 
it's not always so easy for someone to just call into the bank and ask for one of these relationship managers, especially if they have a brand new business, because, you know, they're going to, the, the teller or whoever's there is going to, you know, go follow protocol and keep them exclusive to the businesses that are producing a lot of revenue, um, you know, which, you know, through a lot of, you know, trial and error, a lot of calling, things like that, you could eventually find really cool bankers like people I've been able to meet um, who are willing to help people who are just starting out too. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. Because I, um, I mean, I know this game is like all about relationships, right? And so totally. everything that I've ever accomplished has never been just freaking yeah on your own my thing and it's good success comes through people exactly yeah Yeah. so you're you're just in constant communication with these relationship managers um is is like american express still just like the best limits (laughs) good question i mean (laughs) they i i'm like forever grateful for american express personally because they definitely helped me get my start um those were like the credit cards that i used um when i started my business but yeah, they do. And, you know, sometimes it could be a little challenging because I have seen people that just get, you know, straight up 2K when they just start, um, if they like apply through the algorithm while other people, you know, can get 25, um, you know, $35,000. I've seen other banks be able to get, give way higher amounts, way bigger approvals. Um, but Amex is still a really, really great card company. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it is you know, and those relationship managers as well are harder to get in touch with because everything they do is online. There's no physical branches. I mean, oftentimes when you call, you're speaking to someone in a different country or in a customer service yeah. role. So um, I've had a couple of people actually inside my group who've referred me some American Express representatives that they've been able to work with themselves. So mm-hmm. they're hard to work with. We have them um, at yeah. American Express and so it's like the main thing we've been getting for our businesses, but it's just like, dude, even just doing it, it's like the communication is just super bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're a pretty algorithmic bank. <laughs> I mean, you just apply for like, they just have everything set up for you to like apply online, like instant decisions. Right. Right. And you know, that's why it's good to, you know, kind of understand like how credit works, especially as a business owner and be resourceful as a business owner to be able to expand outside of just Amex alone right. and be able to get into other banks that you may have not heard of. Right. Right. But what's your thoughts on like these small banks now? Cause everybody's scared of the small banks with the runs on yeah. Silicon Valley. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you obviously want to make sure that, you know, you're, you know, covering your bases with an FDIC insured account. Sure. I mean, that's like, I'm you know, just saying, I guess thing, getting but, credit credit from these small banks. Is yeah, that- very good question. I mean, because, you know, say like that bank closes, your credit line can close, right? So it's always good to have options, right? Just because you have one business credit card doesn't mean that that's enough, right? It's good to have a couple of credit cards, right? You know, some with some big banks, some with some, some small banks too, right? Right. So, you know, it's good to have options because if something like that happens with Silicon Valley Bank and now, oh man, this this was my primary credit line that I was using, you know, now you're back to square one and, you know, maybe you have to, you know, start applying for more credit cards. Maybe you also need a bridge loan, Yeah, (laughs) you know, something like that. Right. So it's good to have options. I mean, I know a lot of people that don't like to have too many credit cards, but it's good to have like maybe a handful or two. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen some people with like 50, 60, 70 credit cards, like, yeah. Yeah. That's what it's like for me. I've, I think I've have now nearly like 30 credit cards I've gotten over the last two years. Oh, uh, you should have like, brought them, dude. Yeah. I know, see your they're, collection. they're in my car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, I know this is changing all the time, but what's like your current favorite credit card? Like, cause I know it's just, there's different offers. Well, I really things. do like, I really do like the Amex card right now, but which this one? Is, the gold card. Okay. You know, well that's, that's not 0% either, but you we know, have it. I don't even know, dude, it's so funny. Like at a, while you answer that, I'll say this. Sure. Like one of my guys is all about points and like yeah. all these things. He's like, bro, you got to do this, this, and this. I'm like, bro, <laughs> I don't have time for this. Like freaking, he's like, well, I can refer you to the, um, this guy. He like, can, you can go be first class to wherever. <laughs> I'm like, I would rather just go make more money. Like, I'm not going to deal with freaking <laughs> yeah, yeah, trying exactly. to figure this thing out. And so when they apply for our business cards, they're all like gold or platinum. 
And I'm like, yeah. I have no idea the difference of why I use one or the other. I have, I couldn't tell you what its bonuses are or anything. Sure. Yeah, I I like using the gold card a lot because, you know, for me personally, I spend a lot of money on YouTube advertising. Okay. So, you know, I get four times points on every dollar I spend Mm. for YouTube advertising. So if I'm spending, you know, 100,000 plus a month, I'm getting 400,000 points. That's like eight round trips back to New Jersey, Mm. (laughs) right? So I could go and see my family for free whenever I want. Yeah. Dude, right. I, honestly, I don't even know what we do with our points. Yeah. Oh, they might just be sitting there. I know I know Bro. some other people in our space that just have points sitting. One of my yeah. one of my mentors showed me like four and a half million Amex points. He's like, I haven't used these and I don't know how long. I'm like, man, you could fly like your whole team on a trip instead of, you know, using a you could save some some cash, I guess, right? But yeah. You could use all those points to, you know, like that's four point five million points. It's like I think that's equivalent to like forty five thousand dollars of plane tickets. You know? that's, a, that's a lot of. That's a good. That's a. That's good for a whole team. Yeah, my thing with the points has always been like, people use them for flights and stuff, and I've always just taken the cash back, and I'm just like, I don't really understand the difference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's to each their own, right? Um, yeah. You know. Like I, I like cash back cards a lot. I don't really go for points cards all so much unless it's for a purpose. Right. Right. So, I mean, even with the scenario you talked about earlier with, uh, you know, sure. I'm paying interest on a card, which most people hate paying interest. Right. But if you're making money, like, does it really matter if you're getting a greater return on investment by paying that interest anyway? Yeah. Right. Well, well I'm going to tell the team to start using, um, the gold card, the gold card on our point, <laughs> because that's the best for ad spend. Is, yeah. is it better than the platinum? Well, the platinum, you know, I mean, to be honest, like I have like a little bias, like maybe I have my own, I have my own opinions about the platinum card. I think it's a little bit of a waste to be honest. I mean, I think there's some valuable things with it, like the Dell credit and, you know, maybe indeed credit and Adobe credit, all these different things that you can get with the platinum card. Um, but you know, it doesn't really, you know, attack kind of like those main spend categories right like you know who's gonna spend like you know like not everyone but you know if you're spending like you get five times points on travel right not everyone who's a business owner is just going to be spending on like flights all day they're going to be spending on advertising they're going to be spending on softwares they might be taking clients out to restaurants right you know things where you could actually get better points Mm -hmm. um you know business software stuff like that where the gold card like rewards you for those things like spend money on the gold card but use like the platinum for all the the luxury kind of you know like centurion lounge things Uh you know you could get your annual fee back by you know investing into like dell you know that's why i did i got myself like a printer using like the dell credit right so you, you, that you invest in a Dell and you can wait oh, like, for a fee. Yeah, yeah. Like you get four hundred dollars of Dell credit, right? Like Dell, like computer company, uh-huh. right? Like an Epson printer or like maybe Dell a owns headset. Epson. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. That. Yeah. So I got like an Epson printer um, on Dell dot com. Right. Ep- actually, I forgot about this. Um, Epson's actually uh, sponsoring us now. So shout out to Epson. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're getting us like a big printer thing. I don't really know what we're going to do with it. I think it can make us like banners and all these cool oh, things cool. for our business. And well, that's going to be cool for maybe your uh, your upcoming event yeah. in Hollywood, right? Yep, exactly. So we're going to be using that stuff for WealthCon. And then I think they're printing us like 500 shirts or something. Like it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a cool thing. But like they actually sent it to us the other day of like this giant Epson printer. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. But you're saying back to credit cards, I could just go buy Dell and then get my, what's the, your annual fee. It's like 500 bucks or something. It's like, yeah, like 600, 700 bucks. I think it's 695 now. Okay. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Like I remember every card I used to get was always free. There was no annual yeah, fee. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's crazy for the platinum card. I think that because there's like really no benefit for like spend categories, right? Um, like five times points on. I don't travel. know why I have platinum, but I do. Yeah. And it's what I use the most. There's yeah. no rhyme or reason. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could get one and a half points on, you know, on 
um, purchases over five thousand dollars, but you could then instead get like you know, there's other cards out there like Chase Premier where you could get two and a half percent cash back on purchases over five thousand dollars. Really? That's yeah, two and a half percent is the most I've ever heard. Yeah, I think it's up to a certain amount. I don't often get that card for everyone because a lot of people want zero percent. They're just starting out, but right. you know that's for like you know big spenders, right? So um, you know U.S. Bank has a similar option with their their leverage card, two percent cash back on all your purchases, right? So I mean, that's my, gonna my first card ever that like when this was back when I was broke, I was twenty one, and it's like ah, I guess I should apply for a credit card. I'm an adult now, and. I, I was just looking it up on my own and I was like, okay, what's the best cash back? I don't care about all these freaking points and stuff. I just want money. Yeah. And at that time, like 1% was like the standard. And then there was this card called the fidelity card mm -hmm. and that was two, $2 back. And uh, I was like, wow, this thing's crazy. So I applied for it, got it. I had to open up a fidelity account for it to work and all that. And like, I've literally had that card for like 12 years. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, well, I'm 24, so yeah. <laughs> I've only had a credit. My, my oldest credit card, I think is like six years old, something like that. Yeah. It's like this bank of America card. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm like now thinking, I'm like, dude, how many points do we have? I'm just like, are you going to go check? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking, but I also, I think our CFO is like, taken over all the stuff so i don't even i don't even know <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah what's uh you know what I, i'll tell you one of the things that always made me super mad was uh i could never get approved for a chase card yeah you know they have very interesting kind of you know underwriting system right so that's why it's you know really good to have a relationship manager for for like a business card especially i mean they could do a little bit with personal cards, but they're not going to do much with the personal cards, the relationship managers. They're focused on working with businesses, um, helping them get business lending products, helping them with, you know, different business products, right? And business credit cards are just one product of many things that they offer. And yeah, just back to that point, you know, like getting approved for, for chase cards, you know, you know, there's obviously people out there that talk about like 524 rule, things like that. But if you know, what is that? Basically, if you, if you are approved for more than five personal credit cards in the last 24 months, they're pretty much just going to shut their doors on you and say, you can't get anything from us right now. So if you know a relationship manager, however, they could help you get around that, you know, too much new credit in the last however many months reasoning why you would get denied, right? Which is what the 524 rule is just for them, right? Not every bank has that, but that is a reason why people get denied for credit cards is that they've opened up too many credit cards recently, right? right. right? That was a that was a reason I was denied for a cre credit card like a couple of months ago. I opened like seven personal cards like a year ago and it was like seven months since I opened them and I tried applying for a card. I got denied and then you know, I did like some, some little tricks of, you know, showing spend on other cards and, you know, opening up a checking account. And then I wound up getting approved for 35,000, like, you know, like a month later. Mm. So I guess my question is, uh, and we were kind of talking about this a little offline, but like, okay, these people that come to you and they get, um, all this credit, like, the main thing is for me anyways, you better have like a reason to use it. Yeah. Because what's the point of just starting the clock on 0% if you don't even know what the heck you're going to do with it? No, totally. No, totally right. And that's definitely something I run into a lot. And there's like so many business models that we were talking about offline other than, you know, just like normally what people see online, like real estate or yeah. like crypto or e-commerce or YouTube. I mean, you were even suggesting like go give you know, your 0% interest credit to a poker player, right? It's a, uh, I think poker that's, player staking. Yeah. Poker player staking out here in Las Vegas. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, well, no, what made me think of that was, uh, because you were saying people will, um, lend it to like these traders to trade for them and oh, stuff. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, you could, if you trusted that person, but you know, it's like in Vegas, so many of these, um, poker players, they take you know, they sell basically like a portion of um, yeah mm -hmm. what they could win. It's like okay, you know what? You're gonna buy me in, and if I if I win, you you'll get thirty percent. Yeah, 
right? And if I lose, which <laughs> poker is obviously very risky, yeah, um, then you know we get nothing. Yeah. But. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of what business really is. It's like putting confidence into the right vehicle, putting confidence into yourself, knowing you're making the right decision. Mm -hmm. So um, and that's, I think, what a lot of people are really looking for when they ask themselves, well, what do I do with the money? Right. It's just really finding vehicles and I mean, I, be I'm, I'm a in. big believer, you know, just having been in business a long time now that like, I mean, you're either doing one of two things, in my opinion. One, you're going to go use it to start your own business. Like, sure. hey, I'm going to go fund, you know, the expenses of this business I'm starting. I'm going to go buy inventory. I'm going to go buy equipment and, you know, spend some money on ads and, and everything else. Right. And, you know, it's going to be trial by error. Hopefully, yeah. you know, we end up getting something that works and all that stuff. Right. Or to me, um, I think real estate is the way, I mean, man, the more access you have to capital and real estate, the better it is. And, um, we're always looking for more money in real estate. So yeah. I think that just whatever means that is private money, business credit, personal credit, I don't really care. Just, just get more capital. Cause we know if we're good real estate investors, um, it's just simply a game of debt. You know, the best real estate investors are, are great at finding deals and operating, but they're also equally great at finding ways to get more money. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking of business, I mean, you just started this business a couple of years ago. And I mean, like you said, at 24 years old on the path to doing eight figures, potentially, um, how the heck did you learn how to like just do all the other parts, right? Like, because credit is just all right. Yeah, great, I, I learned the skill of how to get people more credit and help them and everything. But you gotta know how to run the business of hiring sure. people, marketing, sales. Yeah. yeah, no, those are all like major components in the business. I think one of the most important skills totally starts with communication right? Being able to communicate for all of those different things, like the messaging in your marketing, the messaging in your sales, right? You know, communicating with potential employees, right? It's definitely an important aspect, you know, to start with. But I think I learned a lot of it just from having really good mentors early on. You know, when I first started, you know, I got burned on a couple of bad courses, right? And then eventually ran into someone I knew who would be a good mentor for me. And, you know, leverage 0% interest credit to, you know, kind of move myself further along in the process and, you know, get access to mentorship, to learn sales, to learn marketing, those things. And um, having some experience in the space as a, you know, high ticket closer myself, um, working with other coaching companies, really seeing the ins and outs of how they worked, um, you know, like being affiliated with some people who've ran organizations with people like Grant, Cardone, right? So, you know, being able to see like that org board, being able to see, you know, all those different things and be able to learn from really good people. You know, I think it really, really helped me be able to establish my business, set up the systems properly in the beginning. So now where, you know, in November we had maybe like myself, uh, my guy, Paul, my brother, Joe, and a VA. Now we've went from having a team of like the four of us to over 20 people in just maybe like three months, four mm. months. What's the, what's the future look like? Like wh what are the goals? Yeah. I, I mean, I want to keep adding more people into the machine. I think yeah. I had like a realization in November, you know, I was doing this for myself. Right. And I was just doing it on the small scale of, you know, I was doing all the sales. I was doing all the marketing. Um, I was doing all the fulfillment. Right. And I had to kind of think to myself like, well, you know, obviously this is so great for me, but I see how great it is for other people and like how many people do I really want to reach? And I had to kind of break those limiting beliefs in myself and realize, you know, other people are capable and able of doing a lot of the responsibilities that I'm currently doing myself and, you know, really just focusing on delegating those tasks to other people. I mean, this is totally relevant even in the real estate space along your journey, right? To where, you know, delegating a lot of that work and learning how to do that and like writing down like everything that you're doing and handing it off to another person is such a valuable skill um, and such a valuable tool in your business. Because once you really nail that, you can just keep doing it, keep adding more people to the machine. And then, you know, now you're kind of, you know, one business that's running itself, you could start another business, right? 
another business after that. So that's a lot of the things I think I'm looking toward doing is, you know, really building um, my funding program as great and as large as it can be, but also starting, you know, new ventures, new opportunities. Maybe it could be something in real estate. That's definitely something I'm looking a lot more into or maybe something in regards to like online marketing, Mm -hmm. right? Or different kinds of projects that it seems like you've gotten involved with after, you know, getting involved with, you know, couch flipping, real Mm -hmm. estate, right? So, yeah, I love it. Just a entrepreneur at heart. And yeah, Yeah. I'll, I'll say this, you know, once you develop the skills to do marketing at a high level and sales at a high level and hire people and manage teams and, and all that, you know, yeah, you're, you're right for, for many things. If you're staying kind of in the same, like, uh, in this, in this case, the digital space, um, changing out the product is not that difficult. You know, it's like, yeah, there's a different deliverable now and, you know, there's different nuances to it, but overall it's, it's a very similar business. Yeah. Just having like those systems, knowing what those systems are, you know, like learning how to, you know, develop an organization, you know, with different divisions and different responsibilities per division. Um, I mean, I think having that information to really start really helped me kind of go from, you know, where it was for me just kind of running this as some smaller kind of, you know, one man job with, you know, a couple of friends helping me out to now we got like this organization that I think we were very prepared for just given the prior experience and training and people I'd met along the way to show me and introduce me to this stuff. Yeah. So on this uh, next endeavor for you, I mean, obviously you're, you, you got a long ways to go still just continue to grow this, this business and everything else. And you're going to scale that to wherever, you know, you see fit. Um, on the investment side, what are you looking at doing? Are you, do you think you're going to start investing in real estate? Or? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely, I mean, you know, that's just a really great market. That's something that, you know, I mean, people are always going to need a place to live. People are always going to need office space. Right. Um, I think it, it'll be really interesting over the next couple decades to see how things go with, um, commercial, although it's still like a really hot market where a lot of cash is made. I mean, people are always going to need to a place to live. Right. So, I mean, that's a, that's a really good market itself, real estate. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting things happening online. I think there's a lot of, you know, really stable businesses that can be, you know, ran. And I think having a lot of this experience now growing my own consulting business, you know, I think, uh, I'm going to be able to kind of transition into other things, um, with just the knowledge of sales, marketing, delegating responsibility, how to manage an organization, um, you know, understanding really this like seven division organization board. Yeah. Are you, um, the guy on the ads? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So you have to learn content and, and filming and stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I just really used my phone. I just, you know, <laughs> went out on my patio and just, you know, took my phone out and, you know, just, uh, read off a teleprompter really. Um, yeah. but I knew what I wanted to say and, you know, I knew how I wanted to say it and, you know, didn't want to stumble or take hours to record it. Right. But, you know, um, but yeah, those were all things that, you know, learned along the way, you know, all using 0% interest funding or credit, right. To invest into those programs, to learn how how to to reach ads, yeah, how to run ads, cast a wider net, help more people learn things that I've learned that have helped me and other people. So do you buy your own ads right now too? Oh yeah. You do everything yourself. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I have, you know, I have some help from, you know, one of my mentors who, yeah. you know, dives into my ad account every now and then, but I mean, it's really simple to run once you get, you know, like all the, you know, important information, right? Yeah. Like you know, I filmed a bunch of ads, but I've never, never tried. ran them. No. Yeah. No, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Like running, running YouTube ads and, and like learning how to do that. I mean, there's definitely more technicality I could probably get into, but I mean, you know, it's probably like this too for you with uh, like flipping houses or, you know, other aspects of different businesses, right? It's like a couple of very important things that you, that you know, that really make up like 80% of what needs to be done. Um, You know, like, it's like maybe like 20% of things that you need to do that make up 80% of the revenue, right? 
Mm-hmm. So, um, but like knowing like what those things are like super important, but yeah, I do, uh, yeah, I run my own YouTube ads. I, you know, learn how to do sales all on my own, learn how to run YouTube ads, you know, all with the help of mentors, of course. Right. So mm-hmm. no, that's amazing. Well, bro, it's awesome to see how your business is growing and, uh, what you guys are doing. Um, we'll link to, uh, what's the website? So yeah. Bowgroup.co. Yep. So we'll, we'll link to that down below. You guys can go check it out. And if you're trying to go get credit, um, you know, Andrew and his team can help out. You know, I, I've heard of people like buying LLCs so that they could get credit from them. <laughs> like, is that, is that a thing? Yeah. So there's, that's H Corps. So you have H Corps and Shelf Corps. You can do that. However, if someone is selling you, let's say a Shelf Corp or an H Corp with credit lines or financials already attached to it, that right there is a scam. So you want to run. They're, they're, they're just trying to sell it to you. And then when you get it, it's just not true. Or so, what? yeah. So really think about this. If somebody sold you a uh, five-year-old LLC with maybe $100,000 attached to it and lines of credit, why would they, again, market value, sell it for 5K? It would be way worth way more than that. And so the legitimate Because you're saying way, they could just max it out and not pay it. Is that like what would yes, happen? Yes, it can. They can come in with UCC filings. And so UCC filings get attached to that's like liens on a business. Right. So UCC filings get attached on some of those LLCs and you don't even know it if you're not doing your due diligence. It's similar to checking a title yeah. on a house. If you're not taking liens, you're not taking the, checking the super liens, UCC filings on the LLC can cost you a fortune, even if it's on your main business, which happens all the time as well. So, I mean, like, what's the thing with these guys? Because, you know, in my mind, they're like, well, you know, if you get one of these... LLCs, uh, it, it's already got credit. It's not on your credit or anything. So you can just go max it out and not pay it back. Like that's no. what these guys have said. Yeah. So that's, that's, I'd run. Yeah. I'd run far and I'd run fast. Um, if it already comes with credits, remember the clock is going to start back again the minute that that transfers over to your side. And uh, Dun and Brass Street, again, remember the largest business credit bureau, when you establish it as your new business, that clock now says, okay, hey, this bank account or this business, rather, this LLC is now, let's say, December 15th, 20, it's 2022. Now. It's Ryan's now. The clock restarts. Mm. The golden ticket is going to be the business bank account. That's usually where the clock starts. So, yes, LLC age matters, but you still want that business bank account. This is why I always tell our clients, hey, even if you don't have cash flow just yet, get the business account going. That makes sense. So what what's the benefit then of buying an age LLC, but it doesn't have, you know, uh, credit, right? If it has just the age behind it and you wanted to maybe link it to the business account that you already have, that's a completely separate conversation because at that point you're you're building it out from scratch versus it coming with credit already on it, which is like the same. Right, but why would you buy one of those age ones just to get better history? You'll get more credit. You get the history. Yeah, at that point you get the history. And then if you're already running some type of revenue through your business, you just need something that's a bit more aged. Or if you're planning on going into maybe government contracts, we have some clients that did this. Uh, for government contracts to land some of the bigger deals, you need at least two years on the LLC age. Got it. At that point, that's when it would already make sense to get yourself an LLC. Again, with no credit attached to it, we're just getting the age. We're making sure that there's no UCC filings on it, no liens and no prior debts. That would be the only time. Other than that, once you get it, that's when you go out, you open up the business bank account, you go out and you start applying for business credit cards. You go out and you start applying for maybe terms. So at that point, net 30s, net 60s, net 40s, which we haven't even talked about, but that's a completely separate conversation because that's more of the corporate credit side. What is it? So on the corporate credit side, that's when you're mainly getting, so backtrack, business credit, right, is usually when you are personally guaranteeing it. You're using your own personal credit in order to pretty much co-sign on behalf of your business, right? Corporate credit, that's when it's strictly off of the EIN. So at that point, you're going out and you're getting vehicles under your business's name through your through your uh, business credit because you've built out the trade line. So it's usually four to five net 30s. So net 30s means that you have 30 days from the day that you were invoiced by maybe a vendor to make that payment. That then gets reported over to Experian, Equifax, and Dun & Bradstreet. And that's how you start building out your business credit side. Right. Yeah, I, I know that. Um, so we have a, like a bunch of business credit cards, right? Because we need them to operate and keep our books correct yeah. and everything. But I know we were applying for, co- like I now remember seeing the email from American Express, like applying for corporate <clears throat> mm-hmm. credit too. Yeah. And so you're saying that's different. Corporate credit with, with and it varies by bank. That usually starts at right around two, about two million revenue. 
Yeah. At that point, you don't need to personally guarantee because at that point, the business is and running. And that's it. what I know they're, they're, they were applying for now. Most, I don't most people potentially listening to this are going to fall on the business credit side. So the corporate side is I'm not personally guarantee. guaranteeing it. So you're not personally guaranteeing it. Yeah. So that's when you see some of these people that walk away from Wall Street with these big business, businesses that go under. How is this person coming back out and starting a new business tomorrow? That's why. Yeah, it, it didn't affect this person. It didn't affect this person. Yeah, and I mean, look, that that's just how it is as you go into bigger deals, right? Yeah. When when we go into trying to do these big multifamily deals, we're trying to not have a personal guarantee on it, yeah. like um, at least at some point, right? Yeah. And I mean, that's how most people operate. You can usually make the personal uh, the personal guarantee go away if you're again if you're if you're a business credit and your personal credit isn't that strong just yet. You can make it go away with some cash, mm. more money in. More money down on more stuff. Money, more money in. More money in. You could usually do that with gas cards. So if you're trying to build out, again, your business credit profile, so you'll get yourself like a shell. I like shell gas cards, right? They're everywhere. And so if maybe your your business credit isn't established just yet, sometimes they'll want you to personally guarantee. But one of the ways you can make it go away is you say, hey, $500 deposit. It's now only going on the EIN. Now, if you're wondering, okay, why in the world would I want a gas card? I'm not, you know, I'm not a trucker. I'm not always on the road that much. You still use it even as a business owner because you could take deductions on it. But more importantly, those gas cards graduate into unsecured business credit cards. And mm. so if it's a $10,000 gas card that I can only use at the pump in the next six months, I'll graduate into an unsecured $10,000 card or higher that I can use anywhere. And now I can put it back toward my deals. Mm. That makes sense. Is there anything else people really should know about credit? The main thing, like on the personal side or business side? Either. If you're looking at it from, so going back to the example of if I'm a startup and you're thinking to yourself, okay, I don't have any capital just yet. Are there some options for me? So if you're listening to this, the answer is going to be yes, especially for your students that are listening to this. You can go out and there's going to be three options. You can either get yourself a no doc loan, a low doc loan, or a full doc loan. We'll break those down. So a full doc loan, that's typically when they ask for you know your LLC, your EIN, your articles of organization, and at least two years of tax returns. Usually on that, you can get over $250,000 or more in, in, in a business loan. The second option that you'll have is a low doc loan. And usually on those, they only ask you for a year of tax returns. And then on the no doc loan, that's no tax returns at all. Typically just bank statements, two months, right? Now, if, again, if you're not running any revenue just yet through your business with the no doc, you can go ahead and just personally guarantee it. The only caveat to that is you'll be capped out at 50K but that's 50K that you're able to get without any tax documents, with a brand new LLC, brand new EIN, and, and a brand new business bank account. Mm. So, I mean, for a guy like me, right? I, I got my docs, <clears throat> like, you know, when you say it's a loan, that means that I get it and the moment I pay it back, it's gone, right? Yes, it's gone. Is it like an SBA loan? Like, what am I getting? SBA loans are different. These are These are loans directly at the banks. Okay. And so again, usually credit unions offer these, so or even smaller banks. So what would the like the years be, the rates? How's that work? So on those you can usually get like a five year term and the rates on that go anywhere from five to about fifteen percent, depending on where your credit is. Again, both on the personal side and if you have some form of business credit. Because it is helps. it is it amortized over five years or is it just interest only? It's uh, amortized. Yeah. Dang. So two fifty, your payment be pretty large. On what? On a on a oh, five-year no. loan. Yeah. Yeah, what would your payment be on that? That wouldn't be like, so that, that's be like a, five grand, five about, grand a month. And, and that's the type of capital that you'd get to kind of go and work your way into a deal, assuming you don't have any JVs, assuming you don't have any partners, again, just to kind of get your feet wet. If you wanted to take the, the credit route, you can do the 0% credit cards. You just have to find a way to liquidate them, which we know how to do them. But again, you have to do it right in a way that you don't shut down your company. Yeah, like I did. Don't don't just sell to yourself on PayPal. Don't don't just sell to yourself on PayPal to your other companies. That, that that's a big no no. Yeah. Now let me start off by saying that I personally have never really had great credit, and it's really dumb because I've never been late on payments. I've paid off millions and millions of dollars in loans. I have very high credit limits. I have hundreds of thousands of dollars in both secured and unsecured credit lines, and I have a lot of liquidity. So you would think that somebody with all of those attributes, with a history of always paying back, a history of high credit lines, a history of responsibility, should be the perfect candidate to be over 800. And here's the truth. 
I've never once had a score of over 800. And it's funny because I see all of these YouTube videos about how to achieve the perfect credit score, how to get over 800. And I sit there and look at them like, who's watching these videos? Why do you even need a credit score over 800? What do you plan on doing with it? Because here's the deal, an 800 credit score in today's age will not even really help you that much with any type of loan you're getting. Mortgages are around 3% right now, no matter what your credit score is. Even if you had above 800, you're still not gonna get that much better of a deal. And even when it comes to credit cards, having a high score isn't gonna really help you that much. So if you don't know what you're gonna actually use it for, why are you striving for it? And so that brings up two questions. Number one, if you don't even know what you're gonna use it for, and it doesn't help you that much, why are you focusing so much attention on it? And if you can't find the answer to that question, that's good because I'm gonna tell you the answer to it later on in this video. But the second question you might be wondering is, Ryan, if you're doing all those things, why is your credit score never over 800? Why is it so low? That's a really good question as well. Let me back up a little bit and tell you back in 2015, when I first started flipping houses, I actually had to max out all my credit cards in order to buy our first flip. I had opened up a bunch of credit cards then and I had about $50,000 I could access. And so I did balance transfers on all those credit cards and I ended up getting the $50,000 in cash to use as a down payment on our first flips. Long story short, I ended up making $25,000 on that first flip and I ended up using that profit as well as the $50,000 that I originally maxed out for my credit cards towards my next flips. And I kept those credit cards maxed out for years. And the reason I did that was because I signed up for a bunch of credit cards that had these promos of 0% interest for 18 months. But even after that 18 months, I still kept them maxed out because I knew that I was gonna make more using those credit cards than they were gonna cost me in interest. And that's a big lesson that you guys need to realize with credit. If you're using it the right way, you're gonna pay interest. And as long as you're making more money than the interest cost you, then it's a win. It's the reason people take out leverage in everything, whether it's stocks, whether it's real estate, whether it's credit cards, it's all the same. If you're borrowing money, you pay interest. Yet we have this stigma when it comes to credit cards that we don't wanna borrow from credit cards. It's okay to borrow for student loans. It's okay to borrow for mortgages. It's okay to borrow margin for stocks, but it's not okay to borrow from your credit cards. I think credit cards are a great way to get a business started, to invest in yourself. I think they can be used for a lot of things. But nonetheless, back to my story. I ended up maxing out all my cards for a couple of years. And during that time, my credit was in the 500s. And even though my credit was in the 500s, I didn't care because I was making more money than I ever had in my life. Having bad credit didn't stop me from buying fix and flips for real estate because I was finding really good deals. And there were lenders who were willing to fund me even though my credit was bad. And I'll tell you, even to this day, I'm constantly applying for new lines of credit to get mortgages. I'm applying for business lines of credit. I'm applying for car loans sometimes. I'm applying for a lot of different things. And so it always impacts my credit. And the reason that is, is because I actually use the credit I have. And that's the big aha moment I want you guys to realize and why credit is so overrated. Your credit score decreases when you wanna use more credit. If I start maxing out my credit cards and I start Start applying for new lines of credit, it dings my credit score. But if I don't do anything with my credit and I don't open up any new lines of credit, then my credit score starts climbing a little bit. And the reason is the credit card companies don't wanna see you max out your cards because for most, it means you're unlikely to pay it back if you're hitting your limit. But even when you logically think about it, the credit cards are incentivized to get you to spend more on their credit because you pay them more interest, they get more fees from merchants and all those things. So it's just this weird system where nothing is really aligned. If I wanna apply for more credit, and I wanna use my credit, I get dinged on my credit score. Even though I'm making the credit card company more money, I'm pumping money into the economy, we're spending, we're doing good things, I get punished. So the credit system as a whole doesn't really make too much sense, but it kinda is what it is. And it all brings me back to that original question I asked you guys early on in the video, and that is, what do you plan to do with the credit? If you do achieve this perfect score of over 800, do you plan to actually utilize the credit for something? If you do, your credit score's probably gonna drop. So you gotta decide, is the vanity credit score worth more to you than the actual result of using the credit? For me, I don't care about the vanity credit score. I care about the result from using the credit. I care about using credit to make money. If people wanna give me more credit so that I can go use it and make more money, and I still make my lender's interest, and I still make more money than that interest, it's a win for everybody. So if the price for everyone winning is my credit score dropping, I'm okay with that. And that's what I would rather you guys focus on more than anything. You shouldn't be thinking about how to raise your credit score. 
you should be thinking about how can I use credit to make more income. If I can start using credit as a tool, there's no limit to what I can do to make money with it. I can use it to buy equipment for my business. I could use it for investments. I could use it to buy education. I can do a whole bunch of different things once I change my mindset. And at the end of the day, that's how I view it. I just want as much access to capital as possible. And even if I have to pay a little bit more interest on the capital because my credit score is lower, that's okay. I'm not worried about paying 6% versus 7% or even 8%. That doesn't matter to me in the grand scheme of things. Because if I'm taking out credit, I know I'm about to make a lot more than whatever that interest costs me. And so if you're still with me and you're in agreement, I also wanna add that yes, you don't need great credit to buy real estate. As I mentioned before, I was buying and flipping tons of houses with my credit score in the 500s. There are many different types of lenders that will fund your real estate deals with bad credit and no job history. In fact, at Future Flipper, one of my companies, we teach people how to get started in real estate right now with no money, no credit, none of that traditional stuff that you think you need. So if you're one of those people that wants to focus on making more money, regardless of your credit situation, definitely go to futureflipper.com, hit the application button, and someone from my team will help you out. They'll go over with you all the different ways that you can get started in real estate today. Yeah, I haven't really like pursued trying to get more credit. Um, as far as like this way, like I've raised a lot of money, like I'll go raise private money mm -hmm. to go buy real estate and stuff, but I haven't raised, like tried to like really raise credit. What do you think I could get? For something like yourself, just like personally guaranteeing it or are we putting properties on there? Just personally guaranteeing it. Personally guaranteeing it. I'm sure you're running some pretty good revenue through there. You can show some tax documents. Yeah. At least half a mil. So I would get half a mil from like and a I'm lot being, of sources and, I, and I'm being conservative. Yeah. So you can take that a few different approach, approaches. You can do, if we're just doing the business credit side, you can do some business credit cards. You can also do some B locks some business lines of credit, which I like. And then you could also do maybe some term loans. What's a, what's the difference between all three? So if you have, let's say a business credit card, that's pretty much what that sounds like. It's a line of credit on a credit card that you can use. You can swipe, you can liquidate if you wanted to get the cash out kind of like you did uh, with the transfer. You have your business line of credit, which is similar to a, a credit card. But the difference is that you can actually take the funds out of the account. So let's say if someone's looking at their checking account, you have your checking, your savings. And then that business line of credit is an account that you can go into a bank and actually take money out of. So it's as good as cash. The cool thing about it that's different from a loan or a business loan is that it replenishes this and, and it you could pretty much it's revolving. So you don't have to worry about once I use it like a business loan, it goes away. I get it. You can continue. Once you pay you a loan back, it's, a, it's done. It's gone. It's good for the purposes of big purchases and it's good for the purposes like real estate, buying vehicles for your business. Um, and again, getting some of that common credit to report. But if my two main weapons that I always tell my clients is business lines of credit and business credit cards because they stay on there. I mean, they seem very similar to me. Like if you're saying you could liquidate your capital off the credit card too. The problem with liquidating the capital off of a credit card, it gets a little bit trickier, especially if you're going through maybe pay processors. You just got to use like plastic or something. You can, you can try plastic, but the fees sometimes eat you alive. Or maybe if you go to like a third party. I get it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and some people do it wrong where they try to go and, and you know, this, this happens all the time where they'll try to create a separate entity and they'll try to, you know, run the credit card through that yeah, entity. Yeah. And then, oh, I liquidated 20K, uh, 20K on it, but then all of a sudden the IRS is in that other account. It's like, hey, what's going on over here? It points back to your to your social so that's why you want to be really careful especially with what you see on so, social media so i'll say this for people who so once again i had never dabbled in this there was no social media or anything i was just a guy trying to figure out how to make some money um so when i had those credit cards one of the first things i did was i was like well some of these let me like get straight cash into my bank account those mm -hmm. are tight others i gotta like spend it but i need the cash yeah. i can't you know spend it and so i was like you know what i literally just did what you said i i went on paypal and I build myself <laughs> and I freaking, yeah. I got 10 grand that way. Yeah. And then PayPal shut me down yeah. because PayPal's like, bro, you can't do that. That's against our terms of service. Yeah. And I'm like, why? And then just yeah. like, I, I realized later on, you could not do that. Yeah. And that, and that's, and that's why. So that's why I like business lines of credit because of that. You can pull the cash out on those and then you can get yourself in, into your flips. Got it. Okay. And then, yeah, I mean, personally, like, do you see what well, you had mentioned earlier? Business could be better, but like a lot of people, I guess, shy away from personal. They do shy away from personal. And it's one of those things where I usually go back to like 
the gym, right? If you're going to the gym, why would you want strong arms and weak legs and vice versa? Why would you want, you know, uh, weak, weak legs or weak arms, uh, weak legs? Um, and, and it's one of those things where you want to have strong personal credit. You want to have strong business credit because it's going to help you ultimately get access to more funding uh, because banks are going to see, okay, this person has been responsible on the personal side. And that's usually a clear indicator of how they're going to be over on the business side. So I feel the need to make this video because I see so many different YouTube videos talking about how do I get a perfect credit score? How do I get an 850? And these are a bunch of 20 year old kids trying to have perfect credit. And every time I watch it, I'm like, why? What's a 20 year old kid gonna do with perfect credit? Who cares? You ain't making any money. Nobody's gonna lend you anything anyway. And that's the reality of this. Too many people are concerned about credit versus actually making money. And I'll be quite honest with you guys. I personally have never had over an 800 credit score. And honestly, I could care less. It has never impacted me one bit. And let me tell you why. All right, so let's back up and talk about why would you even want a good credit score? What's the very most important thing that credit gives you? To me, the most important thing is how much money are they gonna give me? That's what I care about. I wanna know who's gonna give me money, who's gonna give me credit cards, who's gonna give me unsecured lines of credit, who's gonna give me mortgages, who's gonna give me auto loans. That's what I wanna know. I wanna know how much money are people gonna give me. To me, that's the most important thing. The second thing is what is the interest rate on the money they're giving me? And I think that's where people get it confused. They are so worried about having a high credit score so they can get low interest rates. Well, I can tell you, I could care less if you save $100 on your payment. What I care about is how much money can you actually borrow? How many things can you actually buy? And you know what's the most important thing that they look at for how much money someone wants to give you? It's your income and it's your assets. Those are the most important things. A bank is going to give you a lot more money when you own real estate. They're going to give you unsecured lines of credit when you got money in the bank. Now, will my credit score help me get a better interest rate? Absolutely. But if you're gonna make me choose between getting a $100,000 line of credit at 7% versus a $20,000 line of credit at 4%, I can guarantee you without even blinking, I'm going to take the 7% $100,000. Because I know in my business of real estate investing and flipping houses, I can do a lot of damage with $100,000. I could care less that I'm paying a little bit more in interest to borrow it. And there's a reason why my credit score has never been above 800, because I'm actually using the credit I'm given. If you're tapping into your credit cards and your lines of credit and this money that banks wanna lend you, naturally your credit usage is gonna be high, which is gonna make your score lower. If you wanna raise your score, you have to pay down that credit and get it lower. At that point, what's the point of even having credit? If I can't even use it, what do I care that my score is high? So that's one of the big reasons I just don't care about credit score. I don't check my credit score every month. I could care less. All I care about is how much money are people willing to give me? Because with that money, even if the interest rate is high, I know I can make a lot more money. And I'll give you guys an example. When I first started flipping houses, I had about $10,000 in the bank but I also had about $50,000 in credit that I was not using. So what did I do? I ended up cash advancing all of that credit into my bank account. So now I had $60,000, but I also had maxed out credit cards. And do you guys know what that did to my credit score? It tanked it. My credit score went to the 500s because I maxed out those credit cards. And you know what? I didn't care because I took that money, I flipped my first house, I made $25,000, I took that money, reinvested it, kept flipping houses, and built it up into millions. And I would not have been able to do it if I was worried about having this great credit score. See, that's the thing with credit, is if you use it, your score will go down. So you have to make the choice. I'm gonna actually use the credit that I have, or I'm not. And if I'm not, why do I even have credit? What's the point? And it's always been interesting to me why my score has never been above 800 because I've never missed a payment. I've never been delinquent. I've paid off multiple mortgages. I've paid off hundreds of thousands in credit. And yet my score still just never goes up because I'm constantly reusing the credit so I can go and make more money. And so that's what you have to ask yourself is, am I more concerned about having a high credit score for I guess the vanity of having a high credit score or am I more concerned about actually using the credit I have and making money? To me, it's about making money. It's not about having a high credit score. What I want you guys to start thinking about instead of credit is how can I raise my income? If I raise my income, I will have access to more mortgages, more credit lines, I'll have more money in the bank. That's much more valuable than a high credit score. 
I've always believed that you can either have a saver's mentality or an earner's mentality. For the savers, they feel like they have a fixed income and they can't do anything to break that. The income is what it is, and for them to actually grow wealth and to accumulate money, they have to save. They have to cut costs wherever they can. So having a high credit score and lower interest payments will help them save money. They'll have a lower car payment, they'll have a lower mortgage, and that will help them. That's great. You can do that and you can go save a couple hundred bucks. On the other hand, you could think, how can I gain more income? To me, being an entrepreneur, this is way easier. I can go make a couple of hundred bucks doing anything and everything versus trying to go save a couple of hundred bucks. If I wanna go enjoy that Starbucks or enjoy eating out, in my mind, I'm like, how do I afford that? How do I earn more income so I can do that on a regular basis? I don't think, how do I save so that I can enjoy this one time? No, that's a saver's mentality. You don't need that. You need to think, how do I become an earner? How do I earn more money to do the things I want? And with earning more money, the credit will naturally follow. Even if your score is not high, you're gonna have access to credit. I have over $10 million in real estate debt right now. And people get scared of the word debt because they don't understand it, but I own a lot of real estate assets, even with not having a high credit score, because people trust me because they know I earn a high income and they know I know what I'm doing. They're not giving $10 million to somebody with an 850 credit score who doesn't know how to earn money. That's the difference, guys you need to get in the earner's mindset. I would also encourage you guys to apply for all the credit you can. A lot of people say don't apply for all these credit cards and all these loans because it's gonna ding your credit. Once again, do you plan on actually using the money or not? For me, if I can go apply and get a couple of hundred thousand dollars in lines of credit that I can actually use, even if the interest rate's a little higher, I'm gonna do that every time. Versus the person who doesn't apply at all because they're worried about hurting their credit that person is not gonna be able to do the things that I'm able to do because I'm actually utilizing what I have. It's kind of a catch-22. You use the credit, you get penalized. You don't use the credit, why do you even have it? Anyways, this video was more of a rant than anything. I hope that it at least made sense to you guys. I don't expect you to agree with me, but all I can tell you is it's gotten me to where I am today. I still utilize my credit like crazy. I still max out credit cards. I still max out my unsecured lines of credit. I'm still refinancing. I'm still getting mortgages. Borrowing money is really the key to pushing yourself to the next level. And that's what makes real estate so great is our ability to borrow. We don't have to go buy everything in cash. We can actually take a very high amount of leverage, which is credit, and go buy real estate and have these assets worth a lot more than the cash we actually put into them. And that's why more millionaires are made through real estate than anything else. Okay, so let's just take me, right? I'm a real estate investor. Um, I need more credit to yes. go fund my house flips, to fund marketing, mm -hmm. to, to fund my business. What would you tell me is the first step? So the first thing that we'll look at is we'll see how your business is structured. So we'll, assuming, let's just say LLC, because that's yep. you know one of the terms that people just know the most. Uh, it's the mo most common one. So we'll see, okay, do you have an LLC? We have a, our EIN. Do we have any business credit already established? So we'll take a look at your Dun & Bradstreet. So we'll take a look at your paydex score, which is your Dun & Bradstreet score, ranges from one to 100. So anything over an 80, it's good. We'll take a look at your Experian, Equifax, same thing. Anything your over Your Dun 80, one is for uh, business, right? Uh, your Duns is for your business, and that's through uh, Dun & Bradstreet. So that's that's a number that you get with Dun & Bradstreet, which is the largest business credit bureau. Okay. And so we'll also take a look at your personal credit because in order to actually get into the game, especially if you don't have any business credit established just yet, you want to have at least a 680 personal credit score. That's going to at least allow you to get access to some form of funding, again, whether it's a personal loan or a business loan or a, a business credit card of some sort. Got it. Okay. So they're basically looking at your personal credit and your business credit Correct. when you go for business. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Especially when starting out. Because yeah. there's really three pillars that banks are going to look at, especially as your business starts to grow naturally. That's going to be cash flow, that's going to be credit, and that's going to be collateral. Usually at the beginning, it's going to be cash flow or credit. And that credit is usually going to be on the personal side. Once you start to scale and you have some properties under, let's say, your business that you're holding, at that point, they can take a look at that 3C or the 3rd C, which is going to be collateral. Okay. So they'll look at your houses as collateral? That's what you're they saying? They can take a look at your houses as collateral. Um, they can take a look at vehicles as collateral, assuming they're under the business name. Um, and that's known more as secured funding. That's a bit more what we call down the road, but that is an option that a lot of business owners can tap into. They just don't know how. Right. I mean, 
So let's just take a brand new student, mm -hmm. you know, here at, um, you know, one of my coaching programs, right? They yes. come in, they just start an LLC and, you know, they, they need more money, right? Mm -hmm. They need more money. We always need more money, right? Of course. So you would advise them to, I mean, obviously tap in personally. Mm -hmm. that, that was how I got started, by the way. Most people know my story, but for those who don't, you know, this was back in 2015, I um, didn't have, I had $10,000 saved up. That was all I had. And I was like, well, I need to get more money. So let me go apply for credit cards. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> there was no Irv or any of these other guys that I knew of. Yeah. Right. So I just went on Google. I was like, best 0% credit cards. Mm -hmm. And so I applied for <laughs> literally a bunch, not only in my <laughs> name, but my wife's name. Love it. And I didn't do any business credit because I didn't know what it was. Yeah. And so I applied and I ended up getting about $50,000 worth of credit. And, you know, I ended up pulling all of it out with a balance transfer. Mm -hmm. I got it liquid and I just rode that credit for, you know, the 18 months that it was 0%. And then even after that, I still kept it out because I was like, well, this money is going to make me way more money than even the 18% that I'm getting charged. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's worth it. Yeah. And so I just kept my credit cards maxed out. I remember <laughs> my credit was like in the 500s, literally from just being maxed out all the time the utilization, for years. Yeah, it took a hit. Yeah, but I was like, I'm making money. Like, I don't care. Yeah. I'm not trying to, like, get financed for a super nice house. Like, I was just concerned about building my business. And that's the thing that a lot of people get wrong is everyone wants to chase the 825. Everyone wants to be above 835. There's really no difference that we've seen of someone that has a 775 and an 815. Like, you're not going to get cheaper money just because you have over an 800, that's going to be something that's even noticeable. In fact, usually senior citizens, I tell this to my clients all the time, jokingly, senior citizens usually have that perfect credit score, but it's because they don't even use it. The mm -hmm. whole point of even having credit is to use it. And so 775, you're golden. 750, you're golden. Uh, it's all about the utilization. Like if you can keep the utilization under that 20%, especially when you're going into a round of funding, you're going to be fine. Yeah. But even then, like... <laughs> What's to me, it was like, what's the goal? Like, do I need, what do I need a 700 plus credit score for? I, I wasn't going to lease, or I wasn't going to buy a car. Like I was fine with my mm -hmm. like 2004 Toyota Tundra. Yeah. I wasn't going to like buy a new house. Like we already had our house. And so I was cool with what we had. I'm like, well, let's just max out the credit cards. Who cares? I have no need for credit. It's like a, as it's far a as the credit score. It's a, it's a vanity metric for sure. Like the people that say, oh, I want an 800 credit score. Why is usually the follow-up question. Why? Yeah. Yeah. It just, I, I still don't know why. I don't know that my score has ever been 800 personally. It doesn't need to be. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't need to be. I, I've seen it. On, I, I don't even check it. I have no idea, but I've seen it on occasion, like over 700, but I honestly can't think that it's ever been over 750. And you've still been able to get some type of funding, even on the personal side. I've never been denied a loan. There you go. Now, do I get the best rates? Probably not. But like, but I you're don't making care. money and you're profitable. That's, yeah, and that's the thing, right? And so that that's the other side of it. Of, uh, you know, hey, once I get access to let's say 100k in, in business funding, which is usually the number that gets thrown around out there, what do I do with it? And if you're asking what do you do with it, then you probably have to re-question how you're running your business and what your end goal is, rather than just again chasing the 800 or chasing the 100k in funding. Yeah, yeah, you got to actually have a purpose for it. 100%. But you know, if you're watching this podcast or you're in one of our programs, we've got plenty of ways you can use oh, that yeah. thing to go make some more money. Um, so, okay, back to like first steps. So somebody comes in, mm -hmm. they apply, you know, they're going to look at, the, let's just say they opened a brand new LLC. Like, okay. are they going to get credit? Like, what's the deal there? Yeah. So if you have a brand new LLC and if you're wondering how fast can I get credit, the answer to that is going to be yesterday, comma, caveat, right? depending on how your personal personal scores are already structured. So let's say that across the board, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion on the personal side, you have over that 680, but ideally at least 725, you're going to be able to personally guarantee your way into at least that first $50,000 in funding, $100,000 in funding for that house flip that you're looking to get into or for that startup capital. Um, and then you'll be able to do that either through A, there's really three ways. A, it's going to be big bank, so think your tier banks, uh, tier one banks, that's Chase, Bank of America, um, Wells Fargo, all the big ones that people know. The second route that you'll take is regional banks. That's maybe on the Southeast. That's banks that are only, only located maybe in Vegas or Cali. And then the third route is going to be credit unions, which I think it's the secret weapon uh, that a lot of entrepreneurs need to be paying attention to. Why? 
they want to work with small businesses that are in the community. And then the other side of that is it's a much smaller competition pool that you'll get versus some of the whales that go into Wells Fargo or Bank of America or Chase that maybe are seasoning their accounts with over $2 million. If I'm a brand new business, I maybe have $15,000 to my name for the startup. That credit union is saying, hey, come over here. You don't need to have the best credit score. Your business doesn't need to you know, be running any revenue just yet, which is something we can get into. Right. Um, and then again, it's, it's a much smaller funding pool that they want to work with in order to pretty much scale that local economy. With mm -hmm. local business owners right yeah it's funny because i um had been with wells fargo for a long time and they literally never did anything for me like it's just they like, don't they, yeah. there's nothing they don't do anything different than any other bank and then um you know i actually <clears throat> had a meeting with jp morgan and that's the private bank it's it's not chase and apparently like they recently came to vegas and it's like from the the sound of what they do, it, it's drastically different than like your traditional bank. We'll yeah. see. The the one thing that I would say with maybe a Wells Fargo is they don't do as much as they should for consumers, but they do have a low barrier of entry for maybe if you wanted to let's say create a business loan out of thin air, so you can create something called common credit. Right, common credit uh, allows you that once that trade line reports on the business side, if you don't have any credit at all. Other banks are going to see that and they're going to say, wait a minute, there's a loan already attached to this business's LLC. So one of the ways that you can do that is Wells Fargo. It's like one of the only things that are worth it with Wells Fargo. And so you'll be able to do that through a secured CD, business CD with them. I think it's like entries like 500 bucks. But if you really want to get juicy with it, put at least 2,500 bucks in there or more um, so that when it reports, it doesn't report as a secured uh, business loan. It reports as an unsecured business loan. And so when other, again, banks see that, that's when you start getting those offers in the mail from them. Oh, mm -hmm. so they're, they're running your credit. They're seeing, oh, Wells Fargo gave them this. We should give them some. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. That's why it gets easier. Like in, in your situation, when you first started out, you had a couple credit cards that you had to get, even though you maxed it out. But after that, you were never denied again. And it got easier. It's all about getting started. Right. Dude, you teach people how to get credit. Exactly. That's what I love to do. Tell, what's going on, Ryan? What's Good to be man? here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude. So tell me about how did this come to be? Yeah, I mean, so I've been an entrepreneur for eight years. And through each of my business ventures, I learned a different way to finance a business. At first, it was just using my hard-earned cash. That, at that point, I was selling hoverboards. And then my second business, I was selling inflatable loungers. That's when I brought on an equity partner. And I was like, okay, this is the best way we could finance businesses. Mm -hmm. The third way, we're doing business loans. We're paying interest for business loans. And then I learned about business credit. What's crazy about business credit is, one, you can get approved for hundreds of thousands of dollars at a 0% interest rate. So at this point, you're not giving away equity. You're not paying any interest. And what's, in, what's incredible is it doesn't affect your personal credit score. So that's what I didn't understand. I, I knew I had top personal credit cards. I love getting points, sign-up bonuses, things like that. But I knew that if you max those cards out, it affects your utilization and, and it'll bring your score down. Right. So business cards, they're not reporting to your personal credit. So once you get approved for a 50K card, a 75K card, you can max these cards out, effectively liquidate the credit into cash, and then use that cash for literally any type of investment. Yeah, dude. So I'll tell you, um, I wasn't that smart when I was doing it, nor actually am I that smart today because my credit's really not good. And um, <laughs> I've never like been late on payments. It's just my utilization is so high with constantly revolving and spending money. Um, but when I first started, you know, I applied for all these personal credit cards in both my and my wife's name. And, uh, you know, I just focused on the 0% cards, like you said, and I was able to scrounge up 50 grand, just like applying for anything and everything. Yeah. Um, I used that to fund my very first flip. And in essence, that deal made me $25,000. Nice. And, you know, from that point forward, I understood. I was like, dude, credit's not a bad thing. You know, debt is not bad if you're using it for, you know, good things to make money. Um, it's bad for when you're buying Gucci bags and stuff. <laughs> of but, course. <laughs> but, um, you know, I that that totally shifted my mind. And as I started to get into other things, whether it be real estate or e-commerce or, you know, buying things for my business to fund, you know, look at the studio. Like, you know, if you wanted to start a, a studio and you didn't have quite the money today, you know, I would say spending money on cameras and equipment is going to be great if you're going to actually use it. So um, I became a big believer in using credit and um, I kind of, 
look down on it before where it's like, oh, you're using credit cards for to fund uh, something. And it was yeah. like, yeah, that's the stigma like Dave <clears throat> Ramsey and everyone gives, but it's not necessarily the truth. Like, I don't care how you get your money to start your business. So um, it's interesting to see that you're doing it in a different way than how I did it, though. You're, you're going the business route, which I don't really have a ton of knowledge on. Yeah, I mean, it, when it comes to raising money, in terms of a, like a few hundred thousand dollars, I feel like it's the easiest way to access money. And at that point, you're not giving equity, you're not paying interest. Um, you can scale so much faster. I, I tell people this all the time. The more money you can borrow, the more money you can make. Because even if you're making the same return, but you're using more money to work for you, you're making more money. Uh, specifically, if you're not paying any interest. You know, you can start more businesses, you can scale faster. And I think for entrepreneurs, you know, to get an extra 100K, an extra 200K, is so so impactful you know what i mean for anyone in, in real estate um you know video, videographers anyone starting any type of company if you can purchase what you need up front it gets you going much faster because you of course you have your overhead so if you can get past that initial phase um, and start making money quicker you know this launch with borrowed money can get you there much faster right so explain to me why you have 50 credit cards like, what am I looking at? Yeah, and so, I mean, I this is something that's relatively new to me. You know, I got my first business credit card um, about two years ago. My first business card limit was a $5,000 limit, mm -hmm. um, incredibly small. Um, but I was able to um, really understand the internal bank rules of the underwriting teams at these top banks. And by reverse engineering it, I realized that we can optimize our personal credit profile, build very strategic bank relationships, um, and optimize the way we're applying for these credit cards to maximize the cards we're getting. So I went from zero business cards to getting approved for a half a million dollars in credit in just over one year. So That's very, crazy. very fast. And, and uh, it's, I want to emphasize for everyone listening to this, this is possible for so many people. I didn't have an aged business. I didn't even have a cash flowing business. I was doing this with new businesses, yeah. um, with, with a credit file that didn't have a crazy amount of age. But you know, when you look at the five factors of your, your credit score, Every single section you can optimize. If you're short on age, you can add authorized users. If you don't have a diversified credit mix, um, there's ways you can get pledge loans where it reports a 95% off paid installment loan, which ultimately helps you get more credit. Um, and when it comes to the limits on your personal side, it's all about comparable credit. So if you have higher limits on the personal side, you can get higher limits on the business side. Mm. And so when I recommend personal credit cards for people to apply for, there's two reasons, two main reasons why you want to get specific personal credit cards. One is building the relationship with that specific grade A bank, like Chase, U.S. Bank, American Express, Bank of America. Um, also applying for the personal cards that give high limits. Because if you can get a card at a grade A bank like Chase and the other, other ones I just listed, that also gives you a high limit. Not only are you building a relationship with that bank, so by the time you apply for a business credit card, they're going to give you more money, but also because you have that higher limit, other banks are going to see that and give you a higher limit also. Got it. That makes sense. So you touched on a few things, like the five aspects of credit, which I want to dive into here in a sec. But um, I guess my first question is, I just looked through all these cards. Like, you know, they all have different, you know, reasons for having them. Like, uh, does it help you to have more cards other than, you know, that you have just more credit lines? Or do they help? The other, do, do they help you get more credit because you have more, you know, lines and everything else? So I only have five personal credit cards and I did most of my credit acquiring with only four. Um, so most of the business cards don't actually help get more business cards because they don't report to your personal credit. Okay. Um, one thing that's interesting is, you know, as we talked about, business credit cards don't report to personal credit. They also don't report to the business credit bureaus as well. And so to get... A business credit score, you have to get vendor trade lines, basically working with specific vendors that report that transaction to the business credit bureaus like Dun & Bradstreet, Experience Small Business. And so in that scenario, to get these vendor trade lines accounts reporting, once you have those accounts open, that actually helps you get other accounts open that will, re that will report higher limits. So those corporate accounts will help you get more corporate accounts. And ultimately, that helps you build a stronger business credit score. And when you have a, a strong personal score and a strong business score, that ultimately helps you get more credit. And what's a vendor trade line? So a vendor trade line is basically working with a business that reports that transaction to the business credit bureaus. So I for example, it. like Quill, Granger, Uline, those are the most elementary vendor trade lines you can get, but they're known 
that if you purchase a product with them, they'll give you net 30 terms. So they'll give you the product, you have to pay for it in 30 days. And then once you pay for it, they'll report that, 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 that transaction to the business credit bureaus to make it show that you paid something, you know, you paid something back. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So, you know, you end up, uh, basically like opening up this whole new thing. Like, cause for me, we, I've only really gone after personal credit and mm-hmm. then, you know, I, the only other debt I go after is just real estate debt. So I nice. get mortgages on all these homes. And I mean, we've got millions and millions of dollars worth of mortgages, right? But credit cards and business, I have not really pursued too much. Um, I have a bunch of Amex Platinums for okay. um, my various businesses. And I don't even know if they have limits. Like they don't even show them. It's like, I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. So, so with the Amex charge cards, there's no preset limit, but there's something called spending power. So for any business that is cash flowing very heavy or scaling on a, on a monthly basis, those cards can be perfect because it, the spending power is almost like a muscle and you working it out. Like the more you spend on it, the more you pay it down, the bigger it gets every single month. Um, so in e-commerce specifically, it's incredible because it can scale with your store. Where right. if you get a, a, a another 0% card that has a fixed limit, you have to do credit line increases to get that increased. Right. Okay. Yeah. So in e you know, obviously I have Lunar e and we've got over 300 clients for Amazon and you know, we're going to continue to grow that. What would you recommend is the best way for them, you know, credit wise to go? Yeah, I would probably do a combination of a 0% card and a charge card. Um, th- my favorite charge card is the business plum and That's, the business gold. We tell them to get the plum because the, the, it gives you 30 extra days to pay it back. Oh, yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why we tell them to give the plum. Okay. But yeah, so business plum one, it's really easy to get because for the bank's perspective, it's very low risk to issue those cards because they are charge cards. So the spending power starts small, but you can scale to over hundred K, um, in a few months. Uh, but that card's great because it gives you 30 extra days to pay it back without paying interest. And if so you it's pay a 60 it, day, it's 60 days. Exactly. And if you pay okay. it early, you get 1.5% cash back, which is great. Right. Um, and then, you know, the 0% cards, you know, there's some cards that give you two X points uh, for every dollar spent. Um, so if you're doing, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars a month on Amazon, you know, you're making an insane amount of points. Um, and then when it comes to credit card points, I mean, that's an in- incredible byproduct of the credit cards. And, um, you know, once you have points, there's ways to use them through transfer partners, basically transferring them from Amex or Chase to different airlines or hotels where you can get a 10x multiple. So if you had 100,000 points, um, like Amex points, on a one-to-one ratio, one cent per point, um, that's about $1,000. But if you, uh, if you use these strategies effectively to transfer them to transfer partners, you can get a 10x multiple, which is 10 times more free travel. You know what's funny <laughs> is... Uh, my marketing guy, his name's Andrew. He runs our ads and other things. And he's very big on credit cards and points. And he was like, Ryan, you got to let me manage your points and stuff. <laughs> and cause you're just, you don't know what you're doing. And I was like, you're right. I don't. And I just don't care. And he was like, dude, you literally spent millions of dollars. Like you need to do this. Um, and I'm like, dude, if you want to manage it, manage it. Cause yeah. I- I'm just like, whatever you give me the cash back. It's, it's one to 2%. Like that's cool. And he's pretty much saying what you're saying. He's like, what if you went to Paris first class, you know? And Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of how he, what he's saying. There, there's insane things you can do. And it's cool because that's just a byproduct from using credit cards. So, you know, we go out to dinner and I see someone using a debit card to pay for dinner. And, you know, I, I kindly let them know, like, hey, if you use a credit card, you can get 4X points per dollar spent. And then you do that for a full year. You have multiple free trips. Um, so That's using something you were doing anyway, exactly, exactly. It's a free by byproduct, right? You know, I have the Southwest card. That one's pretty cool. I have my, my buddy, Sean Bob is my companion pass. Okay. And, um, so I bring him to places. I don't even freaking. he has no purpose of being just cause <laughs> he's there. <laughs> he's the companion. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let me pull out my cards. I'll show my favorite. Okay. So the Amex business gold is my favorite cause it's four X. Forex, um, Forex points per dollar spent on gas and dining. Also for advertising. You guys probably use this yep. card. Forex on gas, dining, and advertising. Uh, yep, so anytime I'm doing gas and dining, I'm always doing this. Um, the Business Inc. Preferred. This is a chase card. This is 3X on travel. And so I'll use this for, uh, for my travel expenses. Um, and then 
the Chase Freedom Unlimited is 1.5x on everything. Right. So, you know, going to the grocery store, getting haircuts, things like that. Um, but those three are my favorite when it comes to my daily spending. Okay. So, okay, legit question. Where's the black card? Where's this? The black card. Oh, uh, we I actually <laughs> talked about this last night with a friend. Um, it, it's a lot of hype. Like when it comes down to the actual value, um, it's a lot of hype for sure. I, I like other cards much better. Yeah. And actually, even... and, and right now they don't even have it available at the moment. Why? Um, I actually don't know. Yeah. What does it even do and how do you get it? It's there's just tons of different benefits and discounts for different places. Um, you have to have a, a certain spend requirement. So the annual fee is uh, a five figure amount. So <laughs> it's like it, it, it could be flex. valuable if you it, it's definitely a flex. It's more of a flex than anything else. Yeah. You know, you, you bring out the black card. They're like, all right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but but also, too, it's like, dude, with today's world. You don't really need the black card to flex. You're like, people know what you do if you're on social media anyway. That's true. That's true. Here, let me highlight a few of my favorite business credit cards. Okay. Um, so by far my favorite business credit card, that's a 0% card, um, is going to be the Chase Business Inc. Unlimited. And I love this card the best because it's it's 0% for 12 months. And by the way, the 0% interest that we're talking about is for the introductory period. So sometimes that's low as six months. Sometimes it's long as 20 months. Like on this business platinum right here, it's 0% for 20 months. And this is a 50K card. Right. So just imagine you know, having an extra 50K that you can borrow for free for 20 months. Do yeah. that for four cards. Yeah, you do that to start your business. I mean, dude, exactly. I mean, that's what I did in my business. And it was so game changing. Yeah, so um, the Chase Business Inc. Unlimited, that card is consistently giving out 50 to 75K limits. Um, but it's super important. Like when you apply for these cards, there are certain things you want to make sure you're doing. And there's different ways you can apply for these cards. You can apply for them in person, you can apply for them in branch, or you can use a relationship manager. Um, so over my couple years on this, on this credit journey, I've been very fortunate to build very strong relationships with relationship managers um, at these high-level banks. Um, these are not individuals that generally hang around the branches, but they facilitate uh, very wealthy people when they get credit cards. And so there's a different process of submitting applications through these individuals. Essentially, these applications through the relationship managers go to the underwriting team. So mm -hmm. it takes a couple of weeks for, for them to give a decision, but it's actually a human looking at your application instead of like going in, into the branch or online. It's just a computer algorithm. Automatically just... Exactly. You whatever. So if you go into a branch, like there's a very, very, very low chance you're going to get a 50k approval. I've actually never seen it. Why? If you, um, it's just it's just the underwriting process. So if you if you want the high limit personal, if you want the high limit business credit cards, you have to use a relationship manager. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It, it is a night and day difference. Well, like, and I know this is true at my banks. Like, I have, I I guess they call them relationship managers or the wealth managers. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they definitely do things for me that they don't do for normal people. Exactly. So you have to get access to those, to those people. Got it. Yep. So, okay. You, you do that to apply. Um, one thing I think about is in the different industries, figuring out what's best. Like you mentioned with e um, the plum card is great because yep. you can wait 60 days, you get one and a half percent, um, and it's going to scale up as your e com scores or e com store scales. Um, but it's probably not great for real estate, you know, because if I'm trying to go take 50K to go fund maybe a deal or marketing or whatever, I can't really do that with the Plum Card. For sure. Yeah, because the Plum Card, you have to pay back in 60 days. The other American Express charge cards, you have to pay back in 30 days. Um, so, I mean, you can use any revolving or any 0% interest business card for real estate. Right. Um, what's super important is, like, after you get approved for a 50 to 75K card, you need to figure out how to actually liquidate that credit into cash. Right. Because some things you need cash, you can't just swipe card for. Um, there's a couple different websites that facilitate that if you have a legit invoice um, that just costs a 3% fee. Um, but sometimes you have to jump through a couple hoops to actually do that with those companies. Emilio and Plastic are the two companies that facilitate. Yeah, some, somebody's brought up Plastic before. Yeah, so I, I've heard some success. Sometimes they have to like, verify certain information and it's kind of a, a pain in the butt to actually do. Um, the other alternative is actually just to run it through a merchant processor. And so the best way to do this is if you have a friend who has uh, a very seasoned like Stripe account merchant processor where they can invoice you for the, the 50K yep. and then they'll wire you the money the next day. Bro, you know what's funny um, is, so I, I encountered this back in 2015 okay. when, I, when I started this journey. And 
I don't think plastic or any of these websites existed yet, or maybe I just wasn't aware of them. So yeah, I, I started to get into this problem of how do I make this cash? Because I can't go <laughs> swipe my card to buy this house, <laughs> you know? Right. So I did two things. One was some of the credit cards had balance transfer. And so like it was different than a cash advance. And I'll let you probably explain the difference. But um, you know, I balance transferred, they sent me a check and it was it was cool. Like I had it and I didn't need to do any of that. It was just straight cash. The other way was what you said was the merchant account. And so what I did was I pretty much invoiced myself on PayPal <laughs> um, to get the cash. And then all of a sudden PayPal flagged it because yep. they were like, yo, you can't do this. Like, we know exactly <laughs> what you're doing. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't think there was anything wrong with this. And they're it's like, to me. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm like, what does it matter? Like, I'm just invoicing myself, but apparently you're not allowed to do that. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely a big no-no. They can, <laughs> they can close your PayPal account. They can close your credit card account. Um, one actually way to get around that. If you do PayPal or Venmo, you can do five to 10,000. I'd be very careful though. Um, and don't do re repetitive transactions. I've, I've done 10K before on PayPal, friends and family, and it worked. I've heard another person that did it and it, that's they exactly got flagged. what I did. Yep. Okay, okay. Friends and family. Um, but if you do have your own merchant processor and you want to use one of your cards, I have heard it be successful if you add, say, for example, um, a business partner as an authorized user to your card and then use your – Use his card. Use his card because it's a different name. I get but it. You do have to be careful. Um, something with I do with what I do in, in my mentorship credit stacking, we have a partner in the program that has um, a very large company, and he is a very seasoned merchant, merchant processor. So he'll send – hundred thousand dollar invoices and you can literally swipe hundred thousand dollars and the next day he'll wire you the money so i mean obviously you got to trust that this guy's going to do that yeah but, but even if even if something happens you just charge back right yeah. that's true so it's very safe so if what's the catch for him he's going to make like a point on it or something he'll make two points and then credit card company always takes three so the total cost is five it'll cost you five but you'll get some points for doing it right? yeah hundred percent so, I mean, if you get one or two points, it basically costs you 3%. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like, dude, if you could go get a hundred grand and it costs you 3000 bucks. And it's easy. It's boom. You got it the next day. It's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. That's totally not unreasonable at all for, um, just these things. I mean, that's pretty much what I did. I think the balance transfer did cost 3% anyway. Yeah. Those cost 3%. Uh, if you do a cash advance and then you pay interest on the cash advance, it's outrageous. It's like over 20%. Dude. And that, t so tell me about that. I noticed that back in that day when I was doing it, it was like, yeah, yeah I'll cash advance it. And then I looked at it and I'm like, why wouldn't I just balance transfer? This is like cash advance is going to charge me 20%. Yeah. Yeah. Like what's the difference? Uh, I mean, so a balance transfer is basically when you're balance transferring the debt from one account to another account, from one card to another card. But they let me do it into a check. That is interesting. I've actually never heard about that uh, specifically. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, like... What bank was it? I want to say U.S. Bank. Huh, a interesting. U.S. Bank um, Cash Plus card, I okay. think, was that first card. From a Oh, from a personal card. Yeah. Maybe it was a personal card situation. Yeah. yeah. And I always recommend to people, don't invest with personal credit because it's just riskier, right? Because say, for example, you know, I have $200,000 of business credit cards maxed out. And then, you know, have, say, for example, the investment doesn't work out. I need more credit, right? Because my personal credit score is not, is, is good because the utilization is low. I can always seek more credit, right? right? But if you're liquidating credit from personal credit cards, you're using that for an investment, that investment doesn't work. Now you're in not a good position because you your credit score is suffering and you can't apply for more credit. Right. So you can use it. It's just riskier. You know, there's there's less margin for error. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for me, I didn't know any better. So I literally was all personal. Even to this day, I'm pretty much <laughs> all personal. Like now that I think about it, um, because I've I've built up so much credit and um like for years my credit score was in the five hundreds because okay. I literally, I just kept the maxed out because in my mind, I said, I don't really give a crap what my credit is. As long as I have this money to go do my flipping business, yeah. I'm going to make way more. And what do I even need my credit for anyway? Like, I'm, I'm glad it worked for sure. <laughs> and it's funny because my dad was the same way when he was building a house in California when I was two years old. He was maxing out his personal credit cards to, to finance the, the house renovations. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was a little disappointed because... He didn't teach me much about credit. He taught me about some personal credit cards, the sign-up bonuses. He would he would take advantage of the sign-up bonuses for sure. 
But I didn't know anything about business credit until I was six years into entrepreneurship. And I heard about it. I'm like, how am I just learning about this? And I think like being an, an American entrepreneur, not taking advantage of the U.S. credit system can be an absolute disservice to your, you and your business. Okay, so it is so powerful, and the rest of the world does not have these resources like we do. Right. Yeah. I mean, borrowing money is what allows businesses to grow, to start. You know, there's no business that just grows on straight cash. Like, it's just, I mean, look at why people go public. It's so they can go raise money. Exactly. From other people. Like, you have to borrow money one way or another. So, my question is, um, you talk about these five things of a credit score. Like, what is that? Yeah, so your utilization, new credit, um, the mix. What is the mix? Uh, credit mix. So it's your, it's your diversity in credit products. Um, so there's revolving accounts, there's installment loans, student loans, Got it. Um, mortgages, things like that. So payment history and utilization are your two biggest factors by far. So one specific example I'll give about utilization, I had a 25K personal credit card that I maxed out and I didn't pay off one month. It brought my credit score down from 800 to 700. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's actually, it's good because it's so easy to adjust. Like if you can just pay that down, your score is going to shoot right back up. And even if you can't pay it down, you can do things like optimize the rest of your credit profile, build the banking relationships. And when you're ready to apply for the business credit cards, you can get a bridge loan have that loan pay down your utilization, let it update on your credit report, and then once that's good, you can apply for all your business credit cards, liquidate the cash out of the business credit cards, and then pay off the business loan, or the bridge loan, I mean. Right. So, and by the way, what's the best way to check your credit? Credit card? Yes. Um, my favorite way is myscoreiq.com. It checks all three of your FICO reports, but if you want to do it for free, you can check on creditkarma.com. It's on your phone. It's free. It shows you two of the three um, so wait, there's bureaus. there's three FICO scores. There's three credit bureaus. Yeah, there's like um, Experian. Yeah, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. And right. every bank will pull from a different bureau. And oh, that what? does change based on your location. And it's incredibly strategic if you can understand what bureau each bank is going to pull from based on your location. So what does FICO score have to do with it then? So the banks, like when you submit a credit application, the banks are pulling your FICO score. And when you check Credit Karma, they're actually showing you your Vantage score, which cre checking Credit Karma can be helpful so you can see the different types of accounts you have, the utilization, late like payments, things like that. But when it comes to the score specifically, it's going to be a different score than you see on FICO. Sometimes it's inflated, sometimes it's, it's less. So every time I'm submitting a credit application, right before I'm checking my FICO score, because I know right when I click submit, the banks are going to pull FICO. So I still don't get, though, like, what is FICO's difference? They just, it's just a scoring system. And so they, they score they're things differently. The three. Um, so FICO, they're, they're comparing, they're, they're giving you a score based on those five factors of your FICO score, based on your payment history, utilization, um, the amount of new credit, um, any derogatory marks, and your credit mix. Okay, so... I know I'm jumping from place to place, but I'm I'm here on American Express because I remember they show you your credit score too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I've got 650,000 points. What, what should I do with that? Um, you should. Where do you want to go in the world? I mean, you can you can go. I, I'm so trying many to go places. to Turks and Caicos. Okay, um, I'm gonna connect you with my good friend Tommy. Travel like Tommy on Instagram. He specializes in planning bucket list trips for people with their points. And he'll turn Will that. Will he do it for me? Yeah. He'll turn that 650,000 points, which is on the one to one, one to one ratio, about $6,500. He'll turn that into 60 grand in value. Really? At least 50 grand. All right. You travel with Tommy, dude. You get a free shout out. So make sure you send me. Yeah. Travel like and, Tommy, I think it is. Travel like Tommy. It's also saying um, I'm pre approved for a Blue Business Plus card. Is that any good? Yeah. That's good. That's good. <laughs> You're like, that's eh, whatever. Um, I'm trying to look well, at yeah, my... no, it, 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 it will show you your credit score on there. A lot of times it's just the vantage score. So I'm trying I always look... like looking at FICO. It's just more accurate for right. sure. And my score IQ.com is, is my personal favorite because one, it shows you FICO and two, if you do need to repair any sort of your, any, anything on your credit file, um, it connects with a lot of the credit repair companies to do that. And I want to emphasize if there's anything negative on your credit profile, whether it be late payments, collections, bankruptcy, too many hard inquiries, anything negative you can fix. That's what's incredible about credit. 
your credit score can be 500 like yours is or was uh-huh. and you can fix it like a lot of people think they have such a low score and they're they're hopeless and the truth is they're not um, credit repair can be extremely effective because anything that's inaccurate on a credit report um, uh, if if the creditor or bureau can't prove that it's yours they have to remove it and the thing with the, the fair credit reporting act there's very short time frames where these creditors and bureaus have to prove that it was actually yours and if they can't prove it they have to remove it and so by law you can dispute ev- anything on your credit report any late payment any collection any hard inquiry mm. um and it's it's with the right strategies it's very easy to get everything negative removed from your credit profile mm. and a huge thing with business credit cards is the because that account doesn't report to your personal credit profile, mm-hmm. you can dispute the hard inquiries you receive from open business credit cards. And because that account isn't reporting, um, they don't have an account to like match it to. And so you, you can dispute inquiries on open business credit cards and they remove them. Mm-hmm. And so basically when it comes to the speed that you're going in credit, the hard inquiries is one of the things that slow you down the most. Because every time you apply for a credit card, you get hard inquiry. If you have too many hard inquiries in a short period of time in the last six months, um, you won't get approved for any more accounts. As the world starts to go more digital, you need to be aware of which businesses are going to thrive in the future. One of the obvious ones is e-commerce. In fact, last year, e-commerce sales did over $4 trillion globally, and it's continuing to grow. Now, if you're like most people, you probably don't have time to learn a whole new industry and start a new business, but there is another way. You could partner with us at Lunar Ecom. We have over 300 e-commerce stores that we have created and managed for our clients. And the best part is it's completely passive on their end. The business model is very simple. You cover the cost of creating and running the store. We handle everything else. We pick the products. We handle fulfillment, returns, and customer satisfaction. After all that, we split profits at the end of the month. This means that when you win, we win. If you want to learn more about how it works, you can watch our case study at LunarEcom.com. I believe that the e-commerce space is going to continue to explode as the world goes digital. So make sure you're with the right partner who's going to be ahead of those trends. So go schedule a call with my team today at LunarEcom.com if you want to learn about how we can start taking your passive income to the moon. Most people want to get rich at all costs. They make sacrifices with their family, their health, and their faith all in the pursuit of money without even realizing it. But what if I told you it doesn't have to be that way? What if you could grow your wealth in all areas of life? Well, it's possible, and that's why I created The Wealthy Way. It's a community of people striving to grow together in all areas, and we have multiple tools for you to use that are completely free. You can get access to The Wealthy Way Planner, where you can set goals and hold yourself accountable on a daily basis. We also have our Wealth Builder Academy, which is over four hours of content teaching you how to manage your time, create the right goals, and all the biggest secrets I've used to grow my life, not only in my net worth, but in all aspects. Lastly, we have our Discord community where thousands of wealth builders are all over the world encouraging one another and growing together. And once again, all of this is completely free. There are no upsells, there are no hidden catches. For me, This is a passion project, and I want to build a community of like-minded people. So if you want to start living the wealthy way today, go to WealthyWay.com. There you can get all the free resources like the course, planner, and Discord community. So go to WealthyWay.com. So my problem is I get hard inquiries not because I'm applying for credit, but because I'm applying for mortgages. Yeah, that you get a lot too. Yeah. So like I'm looking at my credit score right now. I'm going to publicly say my credit score at least as far as American Express is concerned. Um, it says, currently right this moment, and I, this is much higher than I thought, it says 769. So that's, that's pretty, pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Anything above a 720 is solid, for well, sure. as of the month previous, it was 672, 670, 654, then 731 that month before, 740. So I'm like at an all-time high right now. <laughs> there we know? go. Not like Bitcoin. So I don't know, dude. I don't even look at it. Like, I don't even try. I, I'm sure there are inquiries and things, and I, I'm just like, I don't know. As far yeah. as my personal goes, I don't ever get denied for loans or anything. That's good. If, if you're above a 720, you're good. Um, the revolving accounts, like getting approved for 0% interest business cards, those are a little bit more tricky. There are certain criteria we, we want to, you know, make sure people fit into before applying. And if you fit that criteria, y- you can get approved for so much credit. We have tw- 24-year-old guys in my credit stacking program, they're getting approved for hundreds of thousands of dollars at a 0% interest rate. On a brand new business, brand new credit file, they're just following the game plan that I give them 
and boom. Okay, so like in your um, coaching program, are you just teaching them, or are you guys doing it for them? We do not do it for you. Uh, okay. We want to we want to teach you how to fish, not just give you the fish. And so it's all consulting. We te- we walk you through it. There's 20 hours of coaching content. We do weekly coaching calls. Um, you can submit it a credit analysis, which basically gives me all the information that I need to see to give you personally a step by step game plan on exactly what I would do. Yeah. There's certain boxes you want to check off, and once you check off those boxes, you know then you are officially attractive to these lenders. Once you're attractive to the lenders. They want to lend you the money. Right. And at that point, I'll connect them personally with my relationship managers, and then they will facilitate the applications. And okay. that's how you get 50K, 50K back to back. Got it. Got it. So for anyone that wants to sign up, um, we will link to it down below. I'm going to actually call my buddy Jack out here. So you're going to give them something cool if they sign up, right? 100%. All right. So we're going to give um, something cool in the link below. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to do a 10% discount. We're going to do a 10% discount that anyone referred from Ryan Pineda. Um, yeah, so link below. Um, creditstacking.com is our website, creditstacking.com slash success. We have dozens of video testimonies talking about people's experience. Um, but yeah, we're helping over over 375 entrepreneurs right now get access to hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in zero percentage credit. I love it, dude. So tell me this, as a guy who's not going to do that myself, where do I get it done for me? Like, what do I do? <laughs> I, d- I don't have time to like learn it. Like, I just would rather pay someone to do it for me. Yeah, I mean, there are done for you options. Um, They cost 10 to 20% of whatever's approved. Um, The solicitation is absolutely unbelievable. Um, And solicitation of so when you give your 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 information to funding companies, they share it with other funding companies. I went through the process just to learn about, you know, what is this process? You know, I should learn about it. Um, I'm still getting multiple calls a day from other funding companies, multiple emails. And (laughs) dude, it's it's a nightmare. Um, that's generally what happens unless you work with, uh, I don't know, maybe it doesn't happen to all funding companies, but that's happening to a lot of people. Um, they won't get as high as limits, um, per card. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you're someone that is absolutely strapped, you can put in zero time, that might be your best option. But if you're looking for the most effective option, it's, you know, the unique framework that we've created in credit stacking. And okay. even if you have like a personal assistant or an employee, have them go through it. Exactly. Have them go through it, have them, you know, to show exactly what to do. And even like once you submitted a credit analysis in, in credit stacking, you know, I'll walk you through like step by step. Here's exactly the steps I would take. So sometimes it takes a little time. You know, if you have a business that's cash flowing, that's aged, you have banking relationships already, you, it could be a much faster process for you. Um, but the framework that we've created is the fastest framework that uh, I have ever seen by far. Yeah, I mean, I have like friggin' 25 LLCs, so I should be able to <laughs> get some. Kind. That's amazing. And so what's incredible <laughs> when you have multiple businesses is once you run through the card lineup with one business, you can go back and run it through a second business. I just don't think I can get like 2,000 cards. Like that's just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. The, the, there is a limit you, you can get per bank. Like, like I would need like, 12 of your books. You probably, sh- yeah, we could definitely help with that. <laughs> <laughs> so... Tell me about business credit. Like, how's that score determined? Is it like personal? Um, it's quite easy to get business credit scores. Um, so basically, to get a DNB Paydex score, you need three vendor trade lines to report. And so we recommend three of the easiest ones to uh, to get reporting. Once you have three, you're gonna have an 80 Paydex score. At that point, you can start working on your trade lines that uh, to report to experienced small business. Um, it's not a very hard thing to do. It's a bit tedious, um, but we you know we walk step by step through it. Yeah. And it's basically once you get those scores, perfect. And then we, we move on, um, and that will help you get higher limits. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and what? Yeah, go on. I was going to say, another thing that's cool um, is there are ways to get auto loans where th- – because there's specific banks that you can get auto loans for where they don't actually verify that you use the money for an auto loan. Some banks verify, other banks don't. So I just got approved for a 35 k um, auto loan. It's 5% interest over a 60 month term. Um, but they don't actually verify that I used it for a car. Somebody else was telling me that. Um, yeah. I don't even remember who it was, but I was like, really? That's interesting. Super interesting. Yeah. There, there's incredible things you can do. And, um, when it, when it comes to diversifying your credit mix or just increasing your score in general, something I just did a couple weeks ago, which brought me from an 800 FICO to an 826. Um, it's an, it's uh it's called a pledge loan. So Navy federal is a credit union. Um, you can do 
um, a pledge loan against your savings account, which gives you uh, a certain amount of money, whatever, whatever you're borrowing in collateral, and then you pay it off 95%. So now on your credit profile, it shows a 95% off uh, paid off installment loan. Mm. Yeah. So that's going to help me get more credit and help me boost my score to 826. Mm. Yeah, I think it was Navy Federal that they were telling me about that auto thing. I can't remember. But, um, yeah, I mean, dude, the whole world of credit is just, like, insane. Like, how It just much... fascinates me, man. More you can borrow, more you can make. Yeah. So are you just specifically focused on, like, credit cards, or what about, like, unsecured lines of credit and things like that? Yeah, so the, last fo- the focus of the last year, two years, has been credit cards. I'm now working on business loans, line of credits, things like that. Uh, but that that is been the focus by far. And I think for any entrepreneur, that's where they should start because 100%. it's the easiest way to go. And then I think once you max that out, um, like I have at this point, then you can essentially graduate to business loans where you're paying um, you know, 10% interest or maybe slightly lower. So what are you doing with all this credit, right? Are all these maxed out? Like you're using um, A lot of them are maxed out, um, vested into a variety of different things. My favorite investment has been into DeFi crypto. Mm. Um, my mentor, Gavin Swami Crypto, he's taught me a lot about DeFi and you know, providing liquidity into different liquidity uh, pools and uh, making insane returns via interest on top of the appreciation with with crypto. Yeah, and we're um, doing a podcast with him. So you guys are interested in DeFi and crypto, make sure you check that one out. Um, we'll link to it down below as well. But um, no, dude, this was super insightful. Like I've learned a ton. Um, we're going to link to your um, coaching program for people who want to get credit. I think it's amazing. And um, yeah, I mean, my final thoughts on her, on it are that, you know, in business, you need to get funding, whether that be regular mortgages, hard money, private lenders, your own credit, business credit, your friends, your families, like, yeah. you know, it, in order to scale, you got to get money somehow. And um, <laughs> if I would have had this when I started, <laughs> it would have been way different than, I mean, I, I like where I've ended up, but like, I would have been able to scale so much faster and so much less risk than what I did. And I wouldn't have had a 500 score for like three years in a row. (laughs) Hey, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Thanks for making it to the end. The good news is I've got another one that I know you're going to like. And all you got to do is click it right here, linking it right here. All you got to do is just click it and you're going to see this new episode that you're going to love.